address gaps in the system. The House subcommittee heard from Homeland Security and State Department officials yesterday for three hours. A quorum being intimate. The Subcommittee on National Security, Emerging Threats, and International Relations hearing entitled Combating Terrorism, Visa Still Vulnerable, is called to order. All 19 terrorists responsible for the 9-11 attacks obtained legitimate visas to enter the United States. Many should have been flagged as suspicious somewhere along the way, but were not. Would they be able to get visas today? Four years later, the answer to that question is still an unsettling, probably not, but maybe. Without question, the visa process has been strengthened as a security tool, without question. The Department of State has improved training of consular officers and standardized many critical visa adjudication steps from embassy to embassy. Technology has been deployed to improve the speed and effectiveness of a very labor-intense system. Fingerprints are collected, identities are verified, and everyone who wants to visit the United States must be interviewed. But weaknesses and gaps remain in the visa process that could be exploited by those determined to do us harm. Key policies still lack clarity. States counselor staffing patterns often do not reflect current threats and new workloads. Training should be more focused on terrorism travel patterns and fraud prevention. Information sharing, although significantly improved, could be better. And the visa security program of the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, lacks strategic direction. In a report released today, the Government Accountability Office, GAO, recommends the State Department clarify visa procedures and better focus counselor resources on visa posts based on national security implications and workloads. Junior officers should not be dropped into high threat, high volume posts without language skills and adequate senior supervision, but that is still happening. GAO also recommends Congress increase the limited access counselor officers get to the FBI criminal history records maintained by the National Crime Information Center, NCIC. Counselor officers today cannot tell whether an individual hit on the NCIC database represents a major crime or an overdue speeding ticket. The necessary follow-up request to the FBI can take weeks to produce an answer that could be retrieved in just minutes. Recognizing the national security implications of the visa process, Congress charged DHS to set overall visa policy. As part of that mandate, DHS was specifically tasked to place visa security officers, VSOs, in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. But after two years, DHS has no qualitative or quantitative assessment of VSO activities in Saudi Arabia. There is no strategic plan to guide deployment of VSOs elsewhere. Balancing the demands of national security against the very real threat to facilitate commerce, education, and tourism will never be easy. If we are to remain a welcoming and secure nation, the visa process must function as an efficient and effective portal, admitting those who would enrich our culture while denying entry to those who would seek to destroy it. Our witnesses bring a wealth of ex expertise and a breadth of experience to this discussion of visa security. We appreciate their willingness to be here today and we look forward to their testimony. Our, we, are, we have uh, two panels. Our first panel is Mr. Jess T. Ford, Director, International Affairs and Trade Division, U.S. General Accounting Officer, Office rather. Ambassador John E. Lange, am I pronouncing that correct? Lang? Sorry. Ambassador John E. Lang, Deputy Inspector General, U.S. Department of State. And Mr. Tony Edson, Acting Assistant Secretary for Visa Services, Bureau of Counselor Affairs, U.S. Department of State. And Ms. Elaine Dzinski, Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Policy, Border, and Transportation Security, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. 
So let me um, provide the oath, if you would stand. We'll administer the oath, and then we'll start with your testimony. Raising your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give before this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Note for the record, our witnesses have responded in the affirmative. And uh, we'll start with you, Mr. Ford. And uh, the, the, what my practice is in this committee uh, is to, to do five minutes, but we roll over for another five minutes. It's not my preference that you take ten, but it is my preference that you don't try to rush the five, and if you go seven or eight, whatever. Uh, we're more than happy. We, <coughs> we invited you because we did want to hear your testimony. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Ford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like my complete uh, statement uh, included in the record. Absolutely. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss two recent reports on actions that have been taken by the Department of State and the Department of Homeland Security to strengthen the non-immigrant visa process as an anti-terrorism tool. All 19 of the September 11 terrorist hijackers were issued a visa which is a U.S. travel document foreign citizens must generally obtain before entering the country temporarily for business, tourism, or other reasons. In deciding to approve or deny a visa application, the State Department consular officers are on the front line of defense in protecting the United States against potential terrorists and others whose entry would likely be harmful to U.S. national interests. But consular officers must balance this security responsibility against the need to facilitate legitimate travel. In October of 2002, we reported on a number of shortcomings in the visa process and made several recommendations aimed at strengthening the role of national security in the process. The recommendations call for improvements in procedures for addressing heightened border security concerns, enhanced staffing, and counterterrorism training for consular officers. Today, I will discuss the changes that have been made since our 2002 report to strengthen the visa process, as well as areas that deserve additional management attention. First, I will focus on our report issued today on changes in the visa policy and guidance, consular resources, including staffing and training, and the extent to which U.S. agencies share information with visa adjudicators. Second, I will discuss our July 2005 report on the placement of DHS visa security officers at U.S. embassies and consulates overseas. The State Department and DHS have taken many steps to strengthen the visa process as an anti-terrorism tool. Specifically, the State Department has provided clear instructions to consular officers on the importance of national security to the visa process. At every post we visited, including those with special interest to anti-terrorism efforts, consular staff viewed security as their top priority while recognizing the importance of facilitating legitimate travel. To further strengthen the visa process, the State Department has increased the hiring of consular officers, targeted recruitment of foreign language proficient officers, revamped consular training with a focus on counterterrorism, and increased resources to combat visa fraud. Further, intelligence and law enforcement agencies have shared more information for consular officers' use in conducting name checks on visa applicants. Despite these improvements, we found that further actions are needed to enhance the process. Consular officers we interviewed said that guidance is needed on the interagency protocols regarding DHS staff roles and responsibilities overseas. Actions are also needed to ensure that the State Department has sufficient experienced staff with the necessary language skills at key consular posts. While the State Department has hired more consular officers, it continues to experience shortages in supervisory staff. As of April 30th of this year, 26 percent of mid-level positions were either vacant or filled by junior officers. Moreover, State has not prioritized the staffing of its more experienced officers to key posts. As an example, we found that the visa sections in critical posts in Saudi Arabia and Egypt were staffed with first-year entry-level officers and no permanent mid-level visa chiefs to provide direct supervision and oversight. 
Our report issued today calls for further improvements in training and fraud prevention as well as information sharing with the FBI. The Homeland Security Act of 2002 authorized the assignment of DHS employees to U.S. embassies and consulates to provide expert advice and training to consular officers regarding visa security. In September of 2003, DHS is assigned visa security officers to consular posts in Saudi Arabia. DHS also plans to assign staff to other posts to strengthen the visa process at these locations. The visa security officers assigned to, assigned to Saudi Arabia review all visa applications prior to final adjudication by consular officers and assist consular officers with interviews and fraud prevention. According to senior officials in Saudi Arabia, the visa security officers in Riyadh and Jeddah have strengthened the process. However, no comprehensive data exists to measure the performance of the visa security officers or to demonstrate their impact. In addition, the requirement to review all visa applications in Saudi Arabia limits the officer's ability to provide additional training and other services to consular officials, such as assisting with interviews and training in visa fraud. We found that DHS planned to e expand the visa security program to five overseas post posts in fiscal year 2005 and intends to further expand the program in future years. However, the expansion of the program has been delayed because embassy and State Department officials have raised concerns about the program's goals, staffing requirements, and coordination plans. According to DHS officials, the Department provided sufficient responses throughout 2004 and 2005 to address these concerns. However, we noted that DHS has not developed a strategic plan for its visa security operations in Saudi Arabia or at any of the expanded posts that def defines mission priorities, long-term goals, and identifies outcomes expected at each post. We have made recommendations that DHS develop such a strategic plan to guide visa security process and to develop performance data to show what impact their agents are having overseas. Mr. Chairman, this concludes, concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ford. Uh, Ambassador. You're going to have to move probably a little closer to here, at least in the middle. Yeah. Is that okay for you? Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to provide the Office of Inspector General's observations about the Department of State's progress since 2002 in strengthening the visa process as an anti-terrorism tool. For the sake of brevity, Mr. Chairman, I will today present highlights from the full statement that I am submitting for the record. <coughs> Among OIG's body of work on this subject over the last four years, our December 2002 report on visa issuance policy and procedures continues to serve as a baseline to measure the Department of State's progress in strengthening non-immigrant visa operations worldwide. That report identified four areas where the visa process needed strengthening. In, uh, including improved executive oversight and supervisory leadership, increased consular section staffing, specialized national security training, and the need for adequate consular workspace and facilities for implementing new visa process requirements. We also have identified fraud prevention programs as a fifth key topic. Overall, in our judgment, the Department of State has made extensive strides in strengthening the visa process since September 11th a day that profoundly changed U.S. border security policy. Regarding executive oversight and supervisory leadership, recent OIG reviews indicate that the Bureau of Consular Affairs has made substantial improvements in standardizing visa policy and procedures. Since 2002, the Bureau has repeatedly reinforced the consular oversight responsibilities of chiefs of mission and has instituted a mandatory annual certification of consular management controls. Our recent report on the visa referral process, dated March 2005, discussed dramatic improvement in the referral system that is now codified, more transparent, and more accountable than before, with ambassadors and deputy chiefs of mission clearly responsible for a mission's referral system and its integrity. On consular section staffing, 
This office in 2002 identified inadequate staffing levels of consular sections as the single most serious impediment to effective management of non-immigrant visa processing worldwide. The Department of State now employs a staffing model updated every two years that measures the increased workloads for visa officer positions due to ongoing changes in visa processing requirements, including more personal interviews, more security clearances, and the new fingerprinting requirement. Although some improvements have occurred, determining adequate staffing has become increasingly complex. OIG inspection observations would lead us to caution that a one-size-fits-all model does not suit the differences in the type of visa clientele and mix of processing requirements found in overseas posts. The Department has taken steps to mitigate the problem of assigning entry-level officers to consular sections in rotational positions that involve only one year of service in a consular section. And this is a matter that we continue to monitor in response to our recommendations from back in 2002. Regarding national security training, the Department of State has made substantial strides in training consular officers and has addressed requirements spelled out in the Enhanced Border Security and Visa Reform Act. In our 2002 report, we recommended that the Department develop special analytical interview training to help identify visa applicants who are a potential threat to national security. The Foreign Service Institute's basic consular course now includes added emphasis on visa security, including a half-day program on counterterrorism at the Central Intelligence Agency. Over 95 percent of respondents to our survey for a report on standards for refusing visa applicants reported that they had received training in analytical interviewing techniques. OIG has found that many consular sections are following the Department's information sharing directive and arranging with other mission elements to provide current region-specific training on law enforcement, counterterrorism, and techniques for detecting possible terrorist or criminal connections. As noted in our 2002 report, many posts had long-standing inadequate consular workspace and facilities. Over the past three years, many urgently needed renovations for consular spaces were completed using funds from a special three-year consular improvement initiative. OIG continues to identify consular sections with urgent workspace needs and believes this type of flexible funding is necessary to respond to rapid changes in non-immigrant visa trends. In November 2004, OIG issued a report on visa and passport fraud prevention programs that lauded the Bureaus of Consular Affairs and Diplomatic Security for their joint initiative in creating 25 overseas investigative positions staffed by assistant regional security officers who have produced clear, positive results in detecting and deterring fraud and corruption. However, in spite of numerous communications to the field, some consular officers have stated that mission management and consular managers have not been effectively informed of the importance of anti-fraud efforts and their direct bearing on border security. In sum, it is clear from our reviews that the Department has made substantial improvements to address gaps and vulnerabilities in the visa process over the last four years but continued progress needs to be monitored closely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I will be pleased to address your questions. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Mr. Edison. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to discuss today's GAO report and the, step, the steps the Department of State has taken to strengthen the visa process. Your mic is on, I think. Just tap it just so I... Yeah, it's yeah. on. Okay. Are you hearing it? Yeah. We have one mic that's a little softer than the rest, but... Well, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me here. The research and recommendations the GAO makes are vital to the Department's work as we move with the Department of Homeland Security towards our common goal of national security and secured prosperity. We know the goalposts are never stationary. There are always additional steps that we will take, can take, to improve visa security. The Department has made significant and rapid changes to the visa process since 9-11 in an effort to push out our border security beyond the United States. As the report notes, today's consular officers understand that national security is job one while they work to facilitate legitimate travel. In order to support that work, the Department has incorporated some 8.9 million records from the FBI's National Crime Information Center into the consular lookout and support system name check database, doubling the records on file. 
We have implemented new regulations requiring near universal personal interviews, rolled out the new tamper-resistant Lincoln non-immigrant visa foil, and completed worldwide deployment of biometric software and facial recognition screening. And the list of improvements goes on. As the GAO recognized, the Department has taken numerous steps to enhance consular training. For example, we have quadrupled the number of offerings of FSI's special course on fraud prevention for managers, allowing over 130 consular personnel to complete the course in FY 2005. The content of the course has also been in, uh, revised to incorporate additional material on counterterrorism and a briefing from the National Targeting Center. We agree with the GAO that we must expand this training further and have already begun to do, do so, developing a course specifically on countering terrorist travel. Moreover, because terrorist travel trends are inherently changeable and often country specific, we believe that additional instructions should center on ways to access current intelligence data. Therefore, as part of the basic consular course, all new consular officers trained to effectively access relevant information from the Department and other USG agency sources on the CIPRANET classified intranet. The GAO's report cites the need for greater and more targeted language training. FSI of the Foreign Service Institute has already developed consular specific modules for most of the languages it teaches and has also expanded upon our post-language programs. In light of the security concerns raised in this report, the Department will give careful consideration to extending the current time limitation on language training for entry-level officers assigned to critical threat countries. The report also recommends that state develop a comprehensive worldwide staffing plan. We believe we have such a plan and it's being revised on an ongoing basis. We'd be happy to brief the committee in more detail on human resource planning activities at your convenience. For now, allow me to note that the Department periodically reviews all consular staffing needs to ensure that workload needs are met around the world. Based on these workload reviews, which also take into account priorities such as assistance to American citizens, the Department has established over 400 new consular positions since FY 2002. Our increased level of hiring in fiscal years 2002 to 2004 has since produced our largest tenured class to date. These 152 newly tenured generalists include approximately 70 consular cone officers now eligible to compete for mid-level jobs and help address the mid-level gap frequently cited in the GAO report. An important component of interagency information sharing is access to complete information. This is especially true on the visa interviewing line, where such information is directly relevant to fighting terrorism. As I mentioned previously, in early 2002, and in response to the Patriot Act, we worked closely with the FBI to transfer, transfer names from FBI databases into the class system, culminating in an online linkage of those two databases. Since then, thousands of ineligible visa applicants have been denied visas who otherwise might have received visas had their names not been transferred to our lookout system. However, the GAO report emphasizes that consular officers need some additional information from FBI databases in order to increase their operational efficiency and enhance national security. We in DHS have had fruitful discussions with FBI on this matter and look forward to a solution that meets our needs. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your attention. At this time, I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Edson, uh, Ms. Tosinski. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. I think, as, as we're all aware, developing and implementing effective visa policy is complex and very difficult work. And it is so because we strive to achieve a balance so that the visa system cannot be exploited by those who wish us harm well, it also provides or should provide an open and inviting system that encourages and facilitates legitimate visitors to the U.S. DHS oversight of the visa issuance process is the first component of a layered security approach. We realize that this process must continually be reviewed, refined, and improved. And we appreciate the work of our partners at the State Department and the work that both GAO and our own OIG have done to help us make our programs as effective as possible. Meeting our legislative mandate under Section 428 of the Homeland Security Act requires us to focus on several critical areas invo um, involving visa policy oversight. This morning, I'd like to talk about three of those areas. First, our visa security officer presence and effectiveness. Second, training for consular officers. And finally, ensuring that the visa issuance process supports our secure borders, open doors vision. 
The deployment of VSOs, or Visa Security Officers, to high threat areas of the world is a top priority. In support of congressional mandates, the Department has established two VS, uh, Visa Security Operations in Saudi Arabia which have made the visa issuance process in that country more secure. In the first nine months of this fiscal year, VSOs reviewed 24,000 visa applications in Saudi Arabia. This additional scrutiny has prevented il ineligible applicants from receiving visas, helped to identify new threats and fraud trends, generated new watch list entries, and led to the initiation of domestic investigations. Per GAO recommendation, we are currently creating a database to establish a baseline of these types of VSO contributions that will help better quantify our success and our performance measures. Even as we are reviewing 100% of visa applications, we have not seen a negative impact in visa processing times. In fact, for the time period covering 2003 to 2004, state reported an improvement in processing times at these locations. VSOs have also instituted a pre-screening process that allows consular officers and VSOs to more effectively focus applicant interviews on areas of interest and concern. Finally, VSOs work closely with consular officers during the adjudication process to closely scrutinize applications, clarify immigration law, review suspect documents, and to clarify or interpret derogatory information the consular officer may encounter from a database check. Our VSOs come to the job with an average of 15 years of law enforcement and related experience, and that can be very beneficial to consular officers who may be relatively new to their duties. GAO's most recent report on visa security process identifies the need to put the right people in the right place with the right skills. We fully endorse this assessment, and we are confident that the department's plans for expansion of the VSO program addresses the critical human resource needs identified in the report. In order to facilitate deployment of VSOs to new consulates, both DHS and state will need to increase efforts to educate the embassies on the role of VSOs at the post. We concur with GAO's recommendation that the department develop additional guidance on the relationship between DHS and state in the visa process, and this effort has already begun. And we are moving ahead with the deployment of VSOs to five additional high threat locations beginning next month. We appreciate State Department's support of these efforts. GAO also made specific recommendations to further integrate and share law enforcement information. While most of the report's recommendations refer to the need for database improvements, VSOs themselves are an important link in the information sharing process. Automated systems cannot substitute for human law enforcement expertise. By expanding the department's presence in consulates, we can facilitate the consular officer's access to information and law enforcement analysis critical to their adjudication process. For example, in Saudi Arabia, the VSOs provide up-to-date information on newly identified document vulnerabilities directly to consular officers, such as the types of counterfeit documents that have recently been seized at U.S. ports of entry. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about training. DHS has a statutory obligation to provide training to improve the security of the visa process. This is a critical function that is important not only for the consular officers already at post, but also during the basic consular training taking place stateside. VSOs conduct training sessions for consular officers on topics ranging from port of entry procedures, admissibility, fingerprinting, fraudulent document detection, interview techniques, and immigration and national security law. We've also reviewed the basic consular officer training at the Foreign Service Institute, and we are working with state to identify and develop additional Homeland Security modules. VSU officials conduct classes on the visa security program during consular office basic training. We've participated in two Department of State regional conferences and have participated with state in their consular management assistant team visits to various posts. We believe that the positive training environment developed at the two consulates in Saudi Arabia will be a model for VSO, VSOs deployed to new posts. Training is but one area where we feel VSOs can offer significant value add. In fact, by allowing for some flexibility in terms of how we review applications and what volume we review, as suggested by GAO, our VSOs could spend additional time on training and other value-added value oversight capabilities. Finally, DHS and state have made a tremendous effort to combat the perception that security measures implemented to strengthen the visa process have made it too difficult for legitimate travelers to come to the U.S. 
We've talked extensively with business organizations, educational institutions, and sci the scientific community. And one of the con issues consistently raised by these groups was the lengthy time frame for visa processing, often due to the need for additional security checks on certain travelers. Based on this feedback, we have worked with our interagency counterparts to identify areas of the visa issuance process, such as the security advisory opinion or SAO process, where we can implement more efficient and effective procedures. One example of the type of efficiencies we have identified is the validity of certain SAO clearances where we have extended the validity period for students, certain types of temporary workers, and certain types of vis business visas. This change is a significant improvement over the previous requirement of a new S SAO clearance for each individual trip. In making this change, DHS and state carefully reviewed the existing process and set strict limitations on when the extended clearances apply. In this instance, we were able to fine tune the process to better facilitate travel while maintaining security. We continue to work with state to identify other areas where we can achieve similar results. Visa security is an integral part of the overall border management system. It impacts the security of our citizens, our visitors, affects billions of dollars in trade and travel, and helps define relations with our international partners. We simply can't afford to get it wrong. I want to thank the committee for the support, and I look forward to working in partnership with the State Department and members of the committee on this complex and critical Homeland Security task. Thank you. I thank you very much, and y you had a nice way of describing really what our task is. I mean, this is the JO, the Inspector General, Congress, uh, working with DHS and, and the Department of State to make the system work better. I think for the most part, um, it, it, uh, both uh, that the system is working better, uh, both from JO and Inspector General. But, but we're going to kind of get underneath and just have a better sense of it. What I want to start out, and Mr. Edson, I guess you would be the person to do it. I want you to tell me, we basically have uh, an immigrant process uh, and we have non-immigrant process, tourist, student visas, and business folks coming in and out, and probably there's a whole host of others as well. But, but am I correct in thinking of it as immigrant, non-immigrant? Yes. Okay. Walk me through what used to happen before September 11th, before DHS, before we put this focus on how did 19, 20 people uh, who were not U.S. citizens end up getting into the United States and so on. So walk me through first the non-immigrant, the, the, either way, immigrant or non-immigrant, and then I want you to tell me what it was and what it is today or what, it, what we want it to be today. Just to, I'm trying to set the stage here. At a, at a fairly high level? Yeah. Perhaps? Um, in, in other words, but what was it before September 11th? What, how, did, how did the system work? Immigrants, um, actually the system's been pretty standardized since the late 90s uh, with the deployment of a, of a uniform automation platform okay. for us overseas. So beginning at about that time, you're, uh, a non-immigrant applying for a tourist or student visa would submit an application, a, a printed application, a single page form back and front with a photograph attached and the passport. Um, a large percentage of those cases were submitted without personal appearance required. People would submit them through a what we called a drop box. It might be something as simple as a wooden box with a slot in it in front of the embassy or through a travel agent, through a school educational group. Uh, the applications would then be reviewed some people were interviewed, uh, depending on local conditions, threat and uh, fraud indicators. Many were not. Um, the application was reviewed by our local staff for completeness. Then a, a visa record created in our system. That would kick off a name check automatically. Based on the results of the name check and a review of the application, an officer would then approve or, or deny the case. Denials only took place in person. You'd have to come in in person for an interview for a denial. But either through an interview or without, the case would be approved or denied, uh, and then subsequently issued in the, the issued foil placed in the, in the passport and given back to the applicant. But w w when you checked names, what, what, did the, what was the significance of that? Because you didn't really have anything to match the names with, did you? Yes. What did uh, you have? Even, even before 9-11, the constant lookout and support system had several million records, including the terrorist lookout records that subsequently became the core of the database managed today by the National Counterterrorism Center. Um, so we had that. We did not have FBI data at that time. 
we had uh, enforcement data, most of the so enforcement data. So FBI data, data would be basically a criminal records? Criminal records we did not have yeah. um, at that time. So basically, if you were a non-immigrant, uh, you could pretty much come into the United States uh, either as a tourist, a student, or a business, and um, and were there are there a lot of other non-immigrants that I mean is it countless or is those the big three? Those are the big three. There okay. are varieties of working right. classes. So, but you could basically come into the United States without ever having to be interviewed, without ever making a personal appearance. Right. And if you were to deny someone, they were given basically the right to have an interview. You would not deny someone without at least giving them an interview. Correct. Okay. To make sure that we were making the, the correct yeah. decision. Okay. And that's with non-immigrant. Now that was in the past. Uh, what was it with an immigrant status? Immigrant status uh, has always required. It's a it's a much more regular, drawn-out process that begins with CIS in most cases. The the Citizenship and Immigration Services right. at, at DHS for petition. Well, they weren't DHS then, so or it for was INS. We begin INS, with yeah. INS uh, okay. at the time. A petition is filed. Most cases will go through our National Visa Center in New Hampshire, where we do sort of value-added clerical support for the overseas posts, uh, some of the early correspondence with the applicants. And that's New Hampshire covers the entire United States? I mean, for uh, us, it, yeah, it covers yeah, the entire yeah, world. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, and then when the case was ready for interview, it would be sent overseas to our consular sections, where 100 percent of immigrants were interviewed. Um, and then the visa process to conclusion if, if uh, they were eligible. We did the same sorts of name checks. Um, immigrants have always, well, for the past several years in any event, immigrants have been checked against NCIC. The, no, no, the I, I, don't wanna, I don't want to do since September 11th yet. Before then? Before then they were being checked. I just don't remember when in the 90s that began. Okay, but okay we, in the 90s. We've right. checked immigrants against the, the, the uh, FBI records, criminal records. Um, and so we had that check done. And the case, the case then would be processed to conclusion overseas, again, always with personal interview with an immigrant okay. case. Okay. So it, it, um, the process involved an interview right. for an immigrant. Um, now describe to me what's different about both non-immigrant today versus what it was. You described what it was. And then the immigrant. For non-immigrants, the differences are, are stark, uh, obviously. We, uh, in addition to that flow that I, f that I described before, the, the most significant changes are regulatory changes that we made in, in August of 2003 uh, to require personal appearance from nearly all applicants. Um, those changes were enacted in legislation in December of 2004. So nearly every applicant is now coming in for a personal interview. We expanded the special screening procedures, the screening that uh, only a small percentage of applicants go through, but it's a, a targeted class, targeted demographics identified by law enforcement or intelligence. The data in the I'm, name I'm check. Sorry, I'm sorry, I, I had my Blackberry on, and okay. that's why we were getting the um, feedback, evidently. I, I, I want you, I'm, I'm one step behind again, so I'm going to okay. ask you to start over. I apologize. Excuse so me? I, I want you to start over again as well, to. Sure. Yeah. The, Biggest changes post 9-11 have been in the non-immigrant uh, right. process, which, as, as you could tell, was slightly less formal uh, than okay. the immigrant process before 9-11. Um, beginning in August of 2003, we published a regulation requiring additional interviews, a much higher percentage of visa applicants to be interviewed. Yeah. That same regulation was essentially enacted in statute in December of 2004. Um, there are very few opportunities for waiver of personal appearance now for a non-immigrant. So basically, the rule is you interview. Right. And that if you don't interview, there has to be an, ex an exception? An exception in the statute. Okay. So that's one big difference. That's one, one big difference. Okay. Fingerprinting is okay. a major difference. Right. Uh, we're now collecting um, the, the two index finger scans from all applicants uh, for whom that's required. Uh, we're using the same standard that U.S. Visit uses at the port of entry. So the, the very young, the very old, and then diplomats are not scanned. Uh, that is a second big difference. Those fingerprints, not, not only are we collecting the biometric information, but we're, we're running it against um, the IDENT biometric uh, database maintained by DHS that includes significant amounts of FBI information. So we're catching people, uh, imposters, criminals, 
um, daily. Uh, large numbers of people are being, are being caught that wouldn't have been caught before because of the printing. Um, we have uh, changed the way in which work is process, processed in our sections so that local uh, employees, host government em or host national, host country nationals, or locally engaged American personnel, say spouses of foreign service officers, they're actually allowed to do far less today than they were before 9-11. We've taken them out of anything having to do with the name check system, for example. Um, they have very limited involvement in the biometric system. Uh, just as a security measure, we, we added that in. Uh, we expanded the special targeted screening, uh, which doesn't apply to a large number of applicants, but some applicants are subject to additional screening uh, based on demographics identified by the law enforcement and intelligence communities. That uh, body of people has, has actually expanded, so we're screening more people that way. And we share more information. The name check system that's behind all this has more than doubled in size. Uh, since 9-11, uh, most significantly with the inclusion of the, the uh, FBI data, the okay, 9 now, million. Now, the FBI data, this committee added to the DHS bill, but uh, the data is somewhat vague? The, uh, the data is incomplete. It's, uh, my, actually, the, the, the Department of Justice, in their comments on the, on the GAO report, did a, did a nice job of summarizing some of the issues involved. The, basically, they're managing a biometric database that we are trying to access on a name retrievable basis. What we get back is very limited biographic information from NCIII. Much of the information in that database has no direct bearing on eligibility for a visa. Things like traffic violations or... Uh, but are you able to distinguish between them? We're not able to distinguish based on a name check return. We need to submit a 10 print set to the FBI and get the criminal record in order to distinguish what's important and what isn't. And that's and basically what you want is the criminal record. Or enough of the criminal record that we can determine whether or not it's, it's germane to, to visa and, adjudication. And this has happened for a while. And the argument for this process working this way is what? Why, why would we not streamline this? Uh, a couple of arguments. The, uh, the statute actually requires that we, the Patriot Act actually requires that we submit 10 prints to access this data. Um, I gather that other uh, legislation that governs how criminal data is managed in the United States right, okay. has similar impact. Uh, and then I have been told that the FBI uh, uh, indicates that the, man the way the database is structured makes it a little difficult to extract some of the information, like charge bottom and disposition. line, though, each one of these individuals is not an American citizen. Correct. I mean, so we're, we're really asking about the criminal records of someone who's overseas. Correct. And we're trying to protect their privacy rights? Okay. Let me, um, Ms. Dzinski, um, basically you, you're doing what INS was doing, correct, as a general rule at DHS? Right, within the Border and Transportation Directorate, most of our focus is on the non-immigrant process. Uh, CIS, Citizenship and, uh, Services, handles most of the immigrant work. Okay, well, but let me ask yes, you this. we have the former INS function. Yeah. Of, the, of the people that not, of the people that existed before in some other name agency, uh, what are they doing differently today of the than they did be, uh, before September 11th? Forget where, forget where they're located, mm -hmm. but INS is basically under your jurisdiction. Correct. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they do differently now than they did before? Um, I think we can probably point to a couple major process changes. Um, I'm not as familiar on the immigrant side, um, but I can tell you, for example, that um, there's increased access to certain types of database um, for the immig immigrant review process. Um, as that's a byproduct, I think, of the work that we've done through U.S. Visit uh, and their ability to integrate numerous databases across the department that have both biographic and biometric information. So not only does that help us at the port of entries, but it also can be used in terms of the case management process within CIS. Um, so I think that's one good example. Um, if you look more closely at the non-immigrant side of what we do, uh, you know, we can point to everything from the uh, implementation of U.S. visit, uh, entry, and now exit processing to greater information sharing with the FBI, 
Uh, Tony alluded to the, uh, the work that we're doing with uh, our IDENT and FBI's IAFIS databases to bring those two biometric uh, resources together so we have uh, more information available at our ports of entry and at consular posts. Uh, we're moving towards the 10 print standard uh, so that as people are coming into the country, we're not gonna be taking two prints, we're gonna be moving towards 10 print. That also applies uh, ultimately for the visa issuance process as well. So we can point to numerous activities that we've undertaken uh, to strengthen the system. And a lot of these broader uh, moves that we've made on information sharing and data integration and management have uh, spillover effects for both the immigrant and the non-immigrant side of what we do. Okay, thank you. Let me, uh, before um, uh, Mr. Van Hollen has joined us, and um, I can yield to him or I can just proceed with some questions, Mr. Ford and Mr. Lange. Um, but I, before recognizing him, I would ask unanimous consent that all members of the subcommittee be permitted to place an opening statement in the record and that the record remain open for three days for that purpose without objection so ordered. I ask for the unanimous consent that all witnesses be permitted to include their written statements in the record and without objection so ordered. Are you all set? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, Chairman Shays for conducting these hearings and thank all the witnesses for being here uh, this morning. As you all said uh, in your testimony, we have a obvious important missions within the immigration, non-immigration, non-immigrant visa system to make sure, number one, that we protect our security, but also make sure that we don't stymie unnecessarily the ability of legitimate visitors to come to the United States. And there was a period of time where I think that became a very serious issue where we were, uh, our system was resulting in many legitimate visitors not coming here. I think that continues to be an issue, but I'm pleased with the progress that we've been made I heard a lot of um, complaints, I think legitimate complaints from those in the area of higher education scientists uh, of the delay. And that, of course, has an impact on our economy here and our ability um, uh, to move forward in many areas of, of research. Obviously, within the business community, there were lots of complaints about legitimate business travelers. So I want to th thank you for the progress that's been made in that area. I look forward to working with you, especially if you could pass along, um, Mr. Edson, my thanks to Assistant Secretary Maura Hardy for her efforts uh, in that area because I think she's been working uh, very diligently um, uh, for all of us. Uh, let me just ask a couple questions about the uh, visa security officers, if I could, because uh, one question, I'm looking at the GAO report, and maybe I should start with you, Mr. Ford. To what extent do you believe the visa security officers are really providing value added to our consular officers? In other words, is there duplication? Are some of the tasks that are being performed by uh, visa security officers, tasks that could be uh, performed by consular officers if we gave them additional training, and would that be a better approach uh, to providing for our security than having a, a, another layer? I'm, I, I don't have a you know, position on this issue. I'm really looking to you as someone who's taken an independent look at it uh, for, your, for your advice. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's difficult to answer that question at this point because so far, They've only been assigned to uh, two uh, overseas posts in Saudi Arabia. So the uh, amount of information that's available about the value added of, of those positions is somewhat limited. Uh, clearly, we visited uh, Saudi Arabia in the course of doing our work. We met with uh, all the uh, visa security officers there. We met with all the senior uh, embassy officials. I think the general sense of everyone we talked to there that they were, in fact, bringing some value added to the process. Uh, we noted at the time of our visit that uh, the State Department consular uh, officers assigned there uh, were uh, largely junior people, so having an experienced law enforcement individual there uh, hel actually helped them uh, get their job done. Uh, but I, don't, I can't generalize uh, based on one post whether or not the overall effort is going to be value added or not. I, that's one of the reasons we recommended that. Uh, the Department of H Homeland Security, uh, as they expand this program, uh, provide uh, more data on exactly what the value added is uh, for these individuals so that one can make a judgment as to whether or not, in fact, it's duplicating what consular officers are already doing or whether they're providing some additional uh, law enforcement training and expertise that right now we may not have in these posts. So I'd say at this point in time, uh, it's an open issue as to whether or not this program is going to be value added or not. Thank you. If 
I could have some reaction from representatives from the State Department and Homeland Security, it'd be appreciated. Thank you. Um, well, I think uh, we feel very strongly within the department that the visa security oversight and officer program needs to move forward with the additional deployments and that there's real value add to the process. Uh, I think we need to be sure that we're not comparing apples to oranges. The role of the consular officer, uh, Tony can speak to better than I can, but it's primarily focused on visa adjudication, application review, um, specific skills, inherit in the State Department process. We envision, and I think the way it, it's working in practice in Saudi Arabia, that the VSO role is, is slightly different. Um, there is a review process of the visa application, and that is very important, but we also bring analysis of law enforcement information. We do uh, reviews of trends, for example, and the types of information that we're seeing. Um, we'd like to have our officers play a more regional role so that we can share information and, and gather trends across a region as opposed to just simply focusing on a particular country. Uh, we play an important role in training, whether it's working with the consular officers or even going out into uh, the local community. For example, we've worked with airlines in Saudi Arabia where we've been able to help them identify certain types of fraudulent documents. So I think the way to look at it is uh, a different type of value add and that both of these functions are critical to making the process work. Um, what we hope is that we can move forward with the deployments to uh, the five additional areas that we've identified, uh, recognizing that we need to work on the performance metrics so we have a better uh, process for reporting back to you and that we get the strategic plan in place. Um, however, we hope we're not held up uh, because of not having that plan completed. Thank you. Yeah, we we certainly agree with our with our DHS colleagues um, with everything that Elaine said. Um, the two functions are and ought to be different, and we've worked very closely. We'll continue to work very closely with DHS as that strategic plan is framed to ensure that we're not doing the same work. That that the uh, there's genuine value added on both sides for for all the activities that we undertake. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, we have obviously the visa security officers in one post right now in Saudi Arabia, uh, a plan to expand to five. We have hundreds of embassies around the world. And it would seem to me that where we have consular officers on the front line, I, I would hope that this additional training in security areas and being able to detect fraudulent documents and all that kind of thing was now being incorporated into the training of the consular officers. Has there been a change since 9-11 since with respect to that kind of training for consular officers? And why, why isn't it, it better to make sure that everybody going through the process, all the consular officers, are getting some of this more specialized training so that they can make uh, the kind of you know, assessments and analyses that the DHR, DHS folks are doing? Um, certainly, there have been, there've been significant changes in the training since 9-11. Uh, we added... Um, three or four days to the basic training course for consular officers to include uh, two days of analytical interviewing techniques and some uh, time, significant time spent on fraudulent document identification and uh, counterterrorism uh, briefings from, from other agencies. Um, in addition, we have uh, quadrupled the number of offerings of our fraud managers course so that we were able to bring a, put 130 officers through that course last fiscal year. We have expanded uh, in an effort to get more local access, in the field access to intelligence information, we've expanded training on the classified uh, internet resources that we use to access uh, intel. So we are taking sort of both approaches. We're trying to make sure that our officers are as prepared as possible uh, to deal with counterterrorism threats and, and fraudulent documents and fraud in general um, while working with DHS to frame a role for the visa, visa uh, security officers. Um, that is complementary and, and does the best it can to secure the visa process. Okay. I just was a little concerned when you talked about having these totally separate functions with no overlap. I understand where you have both individuals there, that's important, but you've got, I mean, let's face it, the bulk of our consular officers are right now in, in stations around the world that have no uh, visa security officer, and I think it's essential that we, they have that, 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 that training so that uh, they're there as the, the first line of defense. Let me ask you about the visa waiver program. I'm, there, I don't know how many countries, European countries, uh, where we have an arrangement uh, whereby if you come from one of those countries, you don't require a visa. Is that right? 27. Okay, 27 countries. Uh, and so what is, what is required from those countries? Show a passport? What do you, what do you need to show? 
you want to take that? Sure. Uh, yes, the requirement is to have a valid passport. And as you may be aware, we've actually implemented some uh, new requirements in terms of what those passports need to encompass uh, a digital photo integrated into the data page uh, as of um, October 26, 2005. Um, in addition, we have specific uh, statutory requirements uh, that countries must follow to be part of the VWP. For example, they have to have a relatively low uh, visa refusal rate. Uh, they have to have a low overstay rate. Uh, so we know that folks from that country aren't illegally remaining. Uh, and there's a couple other criteria that are in statute. So it's a combination of those statutory requirements plus some of the new things that we've required on the biometric passport and uh, some refined requirements in terms of obtaining information on lost and stolen passports so that we have a better handle on uh, fraudulent documents coming in. Okay. I mean, I don't have a solution to this issue, but ultimately, I mean, it's fair to say, isn't it, that we are relying on the ability of the foreign governments of these 27, I mean, the, the governments of these 27 countries uh, to police um, the, the, the validity of these documents? Uh, we do require that they have certain standards for the documents. Yes, we do rely on them for the issuance of them. Uh, as VWP travelers come into the U.S., they're still subject to U.S. visit requirements, so we're taking their fingerprints and they're uh, running their information against our databases, uh, which also happens uh, when someone comes in with a visa. So. Uh, there are additional measures in place at the port of entry, uh, so it's not as if these folks are just waved in with the passport. Right, but I, I guess what I'm suggesting, as we commit lots of resources to making sure our consular officers are trained or, or visa security officers in those posts where your people are issuing, or we're issuing non-immigrant visas, uh, it's obviously essential that we make sure that we're confident that the documents being provided by those 27 countries that have waiver programs are not easily subject to forgery because it seems to me that if you're looking for a way to illegally enter the United States uh, and you believe the line of defense that the consular officers and the disease security officers is, is working pretty well, you're obviously going to be looking for another, another way in. And uh, what are exactly are we doing? Uh, we have the standards, I understand. Do we go beyond that in terms of trying to uh, determine the extent to which these governments are protecting against forged documents and illegal. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. This has been a critical issue. Uh, in fact, we've had um, a lot of congressional interest over the past six to eight months in terms of biometrics uh, with with foreign, foreign passports coming from VWP countries, and uh, we've stated uh, to those countries that uh, not only do you need to meet the statutory requirements, but your passports uh, need to encompass certain types of security features. One, of course, is a digital photo integrated into the page <coughs> so you don't have a problem of tampering with the passport. Sometimes you can lift the top piece and take out the photo and put in a, a new photo. Uh, very difficult to do if the digital photo is embedded in the document. Uh, secondly, we're moving towards uh, linking in a biometric chip uh, to the passport so that the digital photo will actually be stored in the chip along with the biographic information in the passport. So when VWP uh, uh, passport holders come into the U.S., uh, when this requirement is fully in place, we'll be uh, checking that biometric information based on the, the chip in the, in the, in the uh, passport. A real, just realistically, what's the time frame for that, that technology to be uh, implemented? Uh, the digital photo requirement, uh, which most countries are already meeting, will come into full effect of October 26th of 2005, so next month. And the requirement for the biometric chip um, follows one year later, and that will be uh, required of all new passports issued after that date. So it will take some time to implement that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, let me, uh, before going to you, Mr. Ford, Mr. Lang. Um, I have a little suspicion when my staff tells me how to pronounce names, they do it phonetically for me, and the last two times they had it wrong, so they have credibility only in that area with me. Um, I would like to uh, have a clearer picture about both the VSOs and uh, the waiver. Um, what I'm not clear about with the VSOs is that it, I, th I felt it was Congress's intent that we would have a number of them in a variety of countries. Uh, was that your understanding of what Congress wanted? 
Yes, it was. Okay, and we have how many so far? We have, uh, well, there were two congressionally mandated locations in Saudi Arabia, so we've, we've met that requirement. And then we immediately started uh, developing. Well, just answer the question. How many do we have elsewhere? Oh, we just have the two. Yeah, I mean, and how long has that been since the, re since the requirement? How, how much? Uh, 2003. Yeah, that's pathetic, frankly. And there has to be a reason, and I want to know the reason. Is it because you've requested to have ESOs in other countries and state has said no, or you haven't even made the request? We have identified uh, five additional locations but where... Just answer my question first. The question is, uh, have you, is it because you, uh, you haven't made the request yet, or is it because uh, the requests were made and state turned it down? And then you can tell me anything else after you answer my question. I don't think it's as simple as saying it's no, because it state no. denied our request. No, no, let's start mm -hmm. over again. Let's take each question. Did you make a request to state to have VSO officers in yes, other countries? Yes, we did. Yeah, don't hide things from us. You know, mm -hmm. the thing I'm having with this administration is that loyalty seems almost more important than the truth. That, that um, we don't get straight answers. We didn't get straight answers for what we needed down in Louisiana. So straight answers matter to me. Answer my question, then give me, then give me spin. The answer to the question is, have you requested to have VSO officers in any other country? Yes, we have. What countries? Um, that's actually law enforcement sensitive information. How many countries? Five countries. So you've requested in five countries. When did you make the request, last week or a year ago? The requests were made uh, starting in 2003. So they were made in 2003. And State Department has uh, so far not agreed to the VSO officers in these countries. Is that correct? Uh, some of the NSDDs have been approved. I actually have a, a timeline. I can find it. Mr. Edson, why is State Department uh, not responded positively to these five requests? The requests were submitted under the National Security Decision Directive 38 uh, procedures that charge the ch our chief of mission, our ambassadors, to balance security, the needs of, of uh, uh, the Homeland Security Act to post uh, visa security officers overseas, and other directives to right size the U.S. presence abroad. Um, that discussion with DHS, it's something we've been actively involved in uh, since 2003 when the, when the requests were submitted. And that discussion is going forward. Some, in some cases, uh, the uh, requests were approved, and the, the uh, uh, positions are, are Isn't available. Isn't it true now. that State Department uh, originally opposed having VSOs in in, uh, in in countries? Not that I'm aware of. No. Did they request that there be VSOs in these countries? In countries, did we make the request when we work in the legislation? Or if you don't know, I'm. You don't know. I, I mean, I'm not aware that we positively requested them. We have worked closely with DHS on every request. Where See, they my sense priorities. is this has been an initiative of Congress mm -hmm. that we have wanted the VSOs. I mean, maybe Mr. Ford or Ms. Lang, you could you could help me out here. Do you, either of you know? The question is, uh, it was my sense that we were not happy with the job State Department was doing. I think I was. I think I even got a call from the Secretary of State about some of what we wanted uh, to have ha happen, and we were looking, there were amendments in this committee about taking away some authority from, from state. And I think the VSOs were the compromise, that state would still do much of this, but we would have, uh, we'd have people totally focused on security from DHS uh, working within State Department. That's what's my understanding. I mean, Mr. Ford or Mr. Lang, if I'm, if, if, is, can you confirm it, not confirm it, or what? You look like you're praying, Mr. Ford. What, what's, <laughs> I need, I need. No, I can confirm that's what Congress wanted. I think the, uh, based on what we know about why there was a delay is that the uh, Department of Homeland Security and the uh, individual embassies that were being considered uh, had some disagreements about what exactly the role of these officers would be. And uh, uh, as Congressman uh, Van Hollen mentioned there earlier, uh, that was uh, apparently unclear to many of the ambassadors about what exactly the, the role of the VSOs was going to be overseas, and it took a while for clarity to come to the fore before they would approve these positions. 
What well, my understanding is that the five posts that they plan to expand, uh, I think all but one of them have now been approved. So uh, okay. four out of the five are going to Why would that be an issue that we couldn't have an open conversation about? Just offhand. Well, tell I me why. Without telling me what the countries are, tell me why. You know, I just, I, we've had hearings about why we, we classify things so that uh, and, and no one sees them practically except a few people see the document. Just tell me why we can't, as members of Congress, in open forum, have a logical conversation about uh, where these uh, five stations would be. What is the reason why we can't have a discussion about that? Can someone tell me that? Why don't we start with state? Tell me why we can't have a discussion. Then THS, tell me why. What's the logic? I, I think we certainly, uh, our DHS colleagues have, have uh, determined that the locations, the specific locations, need to be treated sensitively. But just we could have about, a discussion. Just think about why. They need to be treated sensitively because of what? I'd have why? To, I'd have to defer to DHS. Well, let's defer to that. DHS. Okay. Why, why can't we? And if you don't know, you don't have to tell me. You, know, you don't have to give me an answer. If you don't know, you don't yeah. know. I, I think there are a couple things going on. Um, the first thing is that the, the role of the VSO effort is to expand the footprint of the Department of Homeland Security and to expand our ability to oversee the process. The NSDD38 process um, is obviously a legacy process. and in that process, one of the goals for, th and Tony will correct me if I'm wrong, is to uh, ensure uh, that we're not expanding our footprint, or state isn't expanding its footprint overly uh, to, to a size that they can't accommodate. So there's inherent conflict between the two efforts. And somehow we have to get these processes to work in a more expedited fashion because the the uh, objectives of the two processes are not always uh, in sync. So that's, that's the first thing. Well, let me ask you, once the VSO is in, in uh, uh, a foreign country, will it be known that they're in that foreign country? I uh, mean, it will certainly be known I mean, by... No, I mean, uh, is it, are VSOs like uh, um, CIA agents that we're not supposed to let people know that the, who they are and, and, and so on? I mean, I, maybe I don't have an understanding of what... Of what the, the classification of VSO officers are? Uh, there, uh, my understanding is that they're, they're uh, law enforcement classification. Uh, the, the, uh, we've treated the locations as law enforcement sensitive information, so we have not been public about how many people we've deployed and to what locations so other than the congressionally mandated locations. So the answer to the question is, like mm -hmm. other law enforcement, we don't disclose where law enforcement officials are in various countries? Uh, yes. I mean, we're not going to put out a press release, for example, that we're sending five people next month to country X. But when they're in country, are they, uh, are they treated as State Department employees or DHS employees? When they go to cocktails, what do you do? I work for the State Department. What's your job? Are they, do they, you know, do they? No, I don't think they have to say, I could tell you, but I have to shoot you. I, mean, I, I think that uh, they're known in country uh, in terms of their role. I mentioned, for example, that we have officers that have worked with uh, local airlines in Saudi Arabia. So it's not as if they're working undercover, but we're not public about how we identify high threat locations and how many people we put on the, the job to, uh, uh, you know, Im well, let me, for let those me, functions. Let me back up a second. I was going to ask Mr. Ford what is the best thing uh, and Mr. Lang, what is the best thing that is happening and the worst thing with immigration, non-immigrants and immigrants? What is state doing best? What are they doing worse? What is DHS doing best? What they're doing worse? I'm not even to that level yet. Where I'm at right now is I came to this hearing, listened to four very nice presentations thinking, you know, we in Congress need to be fair. The Inspector General needs to be fair. J.O. needs to be be fair, you know, they're making good progress, uh, and, and J.O. and Inspector Generals, their job is not to be, I got you, nor is it my job to, I got you, uh, or Mr. Van Hollens. But I will tell you the uneasiness I have right now, and then maybe you can sort it out. What I have is basically that we have to kind of give the party line that DHS doesn't want to offend state, state doesn't want to pen, uh, offend DHS. That's kind of what I'm getting a feeling, that it was clear as one of the lines of question that the VSOs, 
where we, they have said there's no clear plan on how many you want, uh, no timelines, that's kind of the impression that we were getting. And then I start to hear this kind of wobbly answers to what to me are fairly you know, logical questions for, for us to ask. That's where I am now. So I've, I've gone from a level of feeling kind of good about things to thinking, you know, if we peel away the onion, I'm, I don't like what I'm seeing. And just to continue, just briefly, the, the, the VSO officers were the compromise, I believe, that Congress wanted. Now, if they aren't needed, if their job isn't defined, then let's have this debate. And let's, and let's have an honest dialogue from state. We don't want them. They're not needed. They, they just, you know, they basically don't interview anybody. They're just there. Uh, it's a waste. And we have too many uh, different departments at state as it is. That part I agree with. We have, you know, sometimes 70 plus people who have nothing to do with state in our state department. But, but then let's know and then let's, with, you know, let's get rid of the law. It's pathetic to only have in two countries. And, and there is something wrong about it. And I don't know what it is, but I want an answer to it. If state is dragging their feet, I want to know that. If, they, if, if, if it's a, a VSOs that aren't needed, then let's, not, let's forget the charade about even having them there. So let me ask you this. W tell me why we need VS VSOs. I'll start with state. And if you don't think we need them, say, I don't think we need them. I don't think you can lose your job by being honest. No. Uh, we need them because, I mean, I, I, let me start by saying that Slow we, down. we are not trying to block the implementation of the law okay, that's in any fair. way. We, we acknowledge that You didn't that ask for them. That's true, right? You didn't right. ask them. You didn't say we couldn't do the job. That's true, right? Right. Okay. This is imposed. But it's them. in the law, so we're trying, we're trying oh, to make enough. it work. We, we have seen in Saudi Arabia and seen increasingly in our dialogue with DHS that there's a, there's a potential for a real benefit here. But as I, as I suggested to Mr. Van Hollen, we're concerned to make sure that we get the mission right um, at the get-go. Uh, these are some somewhat dangerous countries. Um, they're already fairly small and strained physical, physical plants in a lot of these countries. We'd like to make sure that what the mission of the VSOs is um, it really adds value. And okay, it, and it seems been, like it it's does. It's been two years now, right? Yes. Okay, it's been two years. What I'm hearing you say, basically, uh, trying to read between the lines, you didn't ask for them. Congress has said you got to have them. What I'm hearing you say is basically you don't know what they're doing. And, you, and no, let me finish. This is what I'm hearing. And what I'm also hearing is that stiff upper lip, you're going to try to make the best of it, and you'll find a place to put these folks. That's what's coming across. And, and that's okay. I'm a, I'm a little bit misleading then, perhaps. Well, let me ask you this. Could State Department do this job? Yes, ultimately. They I mean, could. Okay, and, and I think that's what their argument was originally. But we've imposed it on you. Now, tell me, in the, in, are we close to finally having an agreement that we're going to get in, into the other four countries? Yes. Okay. And I think that having deployed additional, Saudi Arabia has its mission defined by statute, so it's, a, it's an unusual model. I think having deployed to those additional countries Will, that deployment will end up clarifying the mission significantly and will I, I speed up the process down the road. I don't think that there'll be quite as much delay uh, in the future, certainly not two years. Okay, Ms. Ms. Des Desensky, tell me uh, what the value added of, of the VSOs. Well, we obviously think there's tremendous value. I talked about how most of our, uh, or all of our officers have an average of 15 years of law enforcement experience. So they, they come from a different background than a consular officer. We're talking about Folks who've worked at point of entries, folks who've done numerous types of investigations, right. have spent time abroad working in an investigative capacity. It's a, it's a different yeah. function. Okay, fair enough. You had answered that before, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and so yeah. we don't have a problem with you believing in this. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. But we do have a problem with you not getting, being forceful enough and getting them in there. And, and that, I think, is true. And if, and if you have pushback from State Department, besides going to to your, your um, superiors and so on, I think you need to come to Congress and say this simply, we're getting the pushback and, and we'll help push the other way. Maybe uh, before going back to Mr. Van Hollen and then we'll close up here, Mr. Ford, uh, Ambassador, would you, would you tell me, 
as candidly as you have, do you see value in the VSO officers, or is their value somewhat of a question? I, I can say, I can say, based on our uh, observations in Saudi Arabia, that yeah, they did. In, they did, in fact, uh, add value there. And I think, again, I, I think it's important. This is linked to our other report where we talk about the uh, lack of enough uh, experienced supervisory counselor officials in, in several posts, one of which happens to be Saudi Arabia. Having a law enforcement official there that has the capability to uh, and experience on law enforcement matters that the State Department currently doesn't have, basically they're, they're, that's a value added. And, and every senior official we talked to in Saudi Arabia uh, had that view. The real issue is whether or not you multiply that to the other 210 posts overseas, because some places are going to be different in terms of the environment, the workload, and the other factors that go into making a decision about whether you really need a law enforcement person there or not. Okay. Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in a recent uh, inspection report uh, that we issued regarding a post in South Asia, uh, we expressed some concern about uh, the, a proposed VSO uh, due to the lack of specificity in what the person would be doing, and we wanted, to, uh, we thought it was important that uh, there be a clarification of duties to avoid overlap with the consular section's fraud prevention unit and the assistant regional security officer for investigations. But describe to me the difference between the fraud out of the counselor's office and VSOs. Where is what is the difference? The RSO, uh, the regional security and office. They're state? They're under state. It's yeah. part of the Bureau of Diplomatic Security, and they uh, uh, look broadly at uh, uh, investigations, which could be of uh, locally hired employees, could be uh, of uh, visa applicants, and it's a broad uh, connection. And have they have very uh, close contacts with the uh, local uh, law enforcement authorities? Uh, the Fraud Prevention Unit is more focused on, uh, and that's in the consular section. That's under state. They're more focused on the uh, specifics of uh, the applicants who come in, the documents that come in, uh, possibly false birth uh, certificates, things such as that, and then they work closely with the ARSO to utilize those contacts with the police authorities. And uh, our uh, uh, recommendation in that report was to try to ensure that, um, uh, that the, the VSO that was proposed for this post uh, have a clarification of what those duties are so there would be no uh, overlap. Ben Hahn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and not to go over this ground uh, in too much, too much, but let me just ask a question that really is raised, Mr. Ford, by your uh, response, and it raises a question, I think, generally. I mean, you pointed out that in Saudi Arabia, one of the reasons the people you talked to um, said that the visa security officers were needed, one of the reasons you mentioned was because you didn't have enough mid-level consular officers, which raises, of course, the question of staffing of consular officers generally. And if uh, Ambassador Lange and, the, and other Mr. Ford, others, if you could, you have spoke to it in your testimony um, uh, in part, but if you could just talk a little bit about to the what extent we are short staffed uh, in key posts with respect to consular officers, because that is a separate issue. I mean, I think it is important in Saudi Arabia that, you know, someone is helping fill that uh, vacuum, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be fully staffed in our other posts. I mean, I just go back to the fact that this is right now one post. Even when we expand it to five, uh, you know, we still have, you know, lots of countries uh, left where it's going to be the consular officers, and the consular officers are going to be on the front line, and they need to one one have the training, so that, you know, I mean, the, where I have some trouble with all this testimony is the suggestion that, uh, you know, with the, when these guys aren't around that the State Department consular officer isn't in a position to adequately uh, protect the national security interests of the United States because they don't have this training. Uh, so number one, we're going to need consular officers that have the training in all these other posts, unless we ultimately go to a, a model where every, in every post we have, uh, you know, these security officers and consular officers. So that's one issue. And the other issue is the short staffing. In other words, the, both the, the training of the consular officers, but also the staffing. If you could just speak as to the adequacy of our current staffing of consular officers overseas, what needs to be done to improve it? Is this a, a, a money and resources issue? Is this a priority allocation issue in, within the department? Is it all of the above? What do we need to do? Uh, I'll start. 
Uh, I think this is, I think for us, this is uh, probably the most important issue that we still think requires greater attention, uh, particularly uh, at the State Department. In the report we issued today, we, we cite that as at, at the end of April, uh, the department was short about 26 percent of their mid-level positions overall in the consular affairs sections. Um, we visited Saudi Arabia and Egypt, and we found that at the time of our visit, we didn't have supervisory staff there. Uh, we made a recommendation uh, back in 2002 that the department address uh, a prioritized system of staffing to ensure that we had the right people in the right place. Uh, the department has, in fact, hired more people, but they haven't really implemented the intent of what we uh, called for three years ago and we've called for again in, t in today's report, and that is we believe that since they know they're going to have shortages in the supervisory ranks, they need to come up with a plan that prioritizes posts overseas where the most senior experienced people should be assigned. And currently, uh, they are basically operating the way they normally operate in, in the way they assign their staff, which does not really prioritize those positions. So that's what we would like the department to do is to re-examine uh, and come up with a plan that basically over time says these are our most critical posts, we've got to have our most senior people there. So that's what that's the issue, and that they're they're hiring more people, and eventually somewhere down the road, hopefully all the all the positions will be filled with the right people, but they're not there now. Um, makes sense to me. Uh, is that what the State Department's plan is? I mean, to prioritize posts with respect to if you have a shortage of consular officers, make sure that they're deployed to the places where you think uh, it's most important to have them. Certainly, um, we when we were discussing this with GAO, we were. Uh, trying to discuss with them the, the sort of complexity of the overseas staffing situation. We have to prioritize visa function, the visa function in high security uh, environments, obviously. We also have to make sure we have enough people on the ground to handle American citizens and be, uh, be cognizant of the fact that there is no, there's no such thing as a non-strategic visa. I mean, anywhere we issue a visa, it could be misused. So we can't afford really to let any post, no matter how apparently tranquil, go unfilled. Um, that doesn't mean that the goal is 100 percent when we only got 80 percent of our, of our mid-level people available for supervisory positions, but it is a balancing act from year to year. Sometimes if we have a particularly uh, energetic or talented senior officer in a place, it might make more sense to leave the mid-level position vacant um, and, and assign that person to somewhere else. We try to do our best. Uh, we do acknowledge that uh, uh, there is a need here that we need to be more careful of in trying to, to fill the positions in places like Saudi Arabia in a more timely manner. Now, uh, most of them in Saudi Arabia and Cairo, which were vacant at the time of the study, are now filled. Uh, uh, very fairly quickly, I hope, um, when we send people overseas, do we have to declare them to the country involved, state what their job is? So would we declare that this person is a VSO officer? I think the answer is yes, correct? The answer is yes, that they're declared. I don't, I'd have to take the question in terms of the, the degree of specificity to which we declare their, their uh, function. Yeah. See, my sense is, uh, I'm getting kind of sensitive to this, but if the host country knows that we have a VSO officer, uh, I would like to think that American citizens have a right to know. Um, and um, I would uh, make a request to state, if they are not enthusiastic for VSOs and they're saying no, uh, I'd like them to, to re-argue this case before Congress and have a, have a meaningful debate about it. Um, I, um, and I would make a request for, for state and DHS, if they don't have the resources, don't tell the appropriators that you have everything you need to get the job done. I mean, I, I realize you probably don't go before the appropriators, but w w we're just not being told things that we need to be told in open, in open discussion. And so I'm certainly going to visit this issue, uh, uh, and this committee will as well. Uh, Mr. Ford, uh, Ambassador, tell us the best thing State's doing and, and the worst and the best that DHS is doing and the worst. Uh, I, th I think in terms of using the visa process as a security uh, tool, uh, that from my perspective, the most important thing the department has done is they've made it a priority 
this in is all the state. Little, the State Department has made it a priority in our overseas operations. When you go and talk to consular officials today overseas, and we, we visited eight of them and we contacted another 17, so we covered 25 in total. Every place we uh, met with people or talked to people, it was clear that uh, the visa process as a security device was, was critical to that mission. Yeah. So I would say that's the most important thing is that a change in mindset uh, at the Department of State with regard to ensuring that security is, is part of that process. So that's, the, that's what I would see as being the, the best thing that's happened. I think they've done a lot of other things w in regard to training, uh, in regard to uh, ensuring that, they, that procedures are better, more clear to their people overseas. They've made enhancements in all of those areas, yeah. and we, we want to give What's them credit the for that. What's the biggest weakness? I'm sorry? Their biggest weakness? Right now. The biggest weakness, in my view, is the staffing issue we just talked about. Okay. I, I think at the end of the day, we're talking about individuals that have to make the judgment as to whether or not a person is going to get a visa or not. And, and part of the problem is, though, with staffing of state is that we, we underfunded them for a number of years. We lost a whole number of years of, of folks who could build up in seniority. So we have this gap in leadership. Uh, and, but I'm making the assumption that we are uh, are trying to fill that gap, but now we have a lot more inexperienced folks at state. But I also want to say for the record, I, this committee has responsibilities overseas. We oversee state and defense and so on. We go to a lot of places. I have met some of the finest men, men and women working for the State Department. They're just an awesome group of, of people, and it, I'm very appreciative of the work they do. Ambassador, what's the biggest strength of state and the biggest weakness? If it's different, if it's the same, you can just tell me it's the same. Uh, the, in our perspective at the Office of Inspector General, the uh, the best uh, improvements, uh, in addition to the culture change that uh, could be the that uh, could be the single most overriding mm -hmm. issue that Mr. Ford mentioned, uh, is the training. Uh, the consular training that is done by the Foreign Service Institute in cooperation with the Bureau of Consular Affairs has really been dramatically uh, changed. Uh, the, the, uh, the analytic interviewing, uh, uh, the involvement of the CIA to help on anti-terrorism, uh, anti counterterrorism efforts, et cetera, et cetera. And that's really been uh, a, a huge uh, uh, improvement. And uh, we detect that whenever we go out and visit em embassies and consular officers explain to us what kinds of experiences they have had and what kind of training. Uh, I think consistent with the uh, view of the uh, GAO, is the that the, the, the biggest problem uh, is in the human resource area and it's not that it's uh, going badly but that it needs to be monitored because it's a very complex issue in part because of the uh, uh, issues that you raised mr. chairman regarding uh, the influx of uh, new junior officers that occurred over the last four or five years through what is called the Diplomatic Readiness Initiative to make up for the insufficient hiring in the 1990s and as that bulge of new officers goes through the system, there will be more and more available uh, at the mid-level with experience who will be able to fill these positions. But in this interim right. period, in a sense, uh, there are some problems with junior officers filling jobs that really should be uh, led by mid-level officers. With DHS, biggest strength, uh, biggest weakness? Uh, in terms of uh, us, I'll have to defer to the uh, DHS right, OIG on that to, one. Yeah. So. And uh, are you in a position to just well, again, in, in the case of DHS, really As it relates to, to the, the visa security officer program. I, again, uh, our view is it's too early to tell what the overall value added of these officers will be. We do, as we say in a report, we think that that DHS should come up with a, a an overall plan for how these people will be integrated overseas, and also they need to have better. Uh, information about what the value added is. They need, to ha they need to be able to say that as a consequence of having these people, we've got more fraud cases we're finding, we're finding more bad people than we, we had before. They need to be able to demonstrate uh, that, that the, having these people assigned overseas is actually going to me make a meaningful difference in the overall uh, security process. And right now, they haven't got those metrics, and we think they need to develop those. And they also need to develop them to convince the State Department that it's useful to have these people uh, assigned. Okay. Let me, um, Mr. Edson, um, biggest strength, biggest weakness right now, State. Biggest strength. Uh, I know for your comfort level, I'll just say biggest challenge, okay? <laughs> biggest challenge I, is I staffing. I was reading your, okay. Biggest okay. challenge is staffing. It's not entirely in our hands, but uh, both filling the mid-level gap in terms of people coming up through the ranks, 
um, a better way to address the fact that we, in, with the changes we've made to the visa process, we've, we've definitely broadened the base of the pyramid in, in terms of the, the requirement for more entry-level people or lower-level uh, visa adjudicators is now real and, and continuing. I mean, it'll, it'll be with us forever. So I think we've, we've created a, a dynamic that'll probably result in imbalances in the personnel system on an ongoing basis. Right. And we need, had, we need to figure out how well, to deal with that. Let me just say, um, Congress did that. I mean, you know, we, we underfunded uh, at a point. We allowed you not to hire certain people that created this imbalance of folks. But in addition, I'm thinking in terms of things like uh, the interview requirements and the biometric collection requirements, which we're right, right. now doing okay. with consular officers. You, you just have cre we have created a requirement for a broader base of lower level uh, visa officers on an ongoing basis, and we need to deal with that. Okay. Ms. Tosinski? So I think our biggest challenge is breaking through the NSDD process. It has to move more quickly. We need to speed up the deployment of our folks. They're trained. They're ready to go. We won't have meaningful performance metrics unless we have more people uh, to develop those metrics and to have a right, right. You're just sample size. You're understaffed to develop them? I'm sorry? You're understaffed to develop those? I think that we're going to have a hard time putting performance metrics together if we don't have more locations to add in to, uh, to those performance right. metrics. But, but, but I got the sense from what you were saying is that you don't have the staff to, to, to start to develop those metrics and so on. No, I think we do have the staff uh, ready to, to develop that. The, okay. the issue is getting our people deployed. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, some of that fight maybe needs to be a little more public and you need to involve Congress in this process. OMB uh, uh, is not a dictatorship. Um, it, it may seem like it is. But if, if OMB decides what you're allowed to say before a committee, uh, you're going to have misinformed members of Congress, and we will not provide the resources where they're needed. And there needs to be a little more faith that if we have some knowledge that uh, it will benefit you all. Uh, and it's not being disloyal, telling us where the where these these issues of disagreement are. I mean, it's what makes our job interesting. Is there anything that you need to put on the record before we get to the next panel? Is there any statement you want to clarify or correct from someone else or whatever? Uh, any question you wish we had asked that we should have asked that would have made this a better hearing? Attorney? Sir, I'd like to just sure. add a couple uh, comments sure. to the record. I have a great staff behind me, and they've yeah. <laughs> fed me some Fair good enough. statistics that I'd like okay. to uh, just note okay. for the record. Uh, the first is that uh, we want to note that the ambassador in Saudi Arabia has actually asked us to increase our staff. We think that's one of the best examples of good. the uh, efficacy of what we're doing. Uh, I mentioned uh, we. Um, had started the process on the NSDDs in 2003. That's true for Saudi Arabia, but the four additional uh, uh, countries were submitted in June of 2004. So I just want to make sure that was uh, understood. And in terms of revealing where we have VSO officers, the main reason that we're quiet about it is because we don't want visa applicants moving to the next available post because they know that they won't have to go through that scrutiny. Okay. Well, uh, y you know, uh, uh, I congratulate your staff on good staff work, uh, but, but I would say that, you know, uh, we could make a list of 15 or so countries where you need to have folks. Um, and um, the sooner we get that done, the better. Or State Department needs to be making sure they're doing what the VSO folks would be doing. Uh, you all are good people. I thank you for your service to your country. and. Uh, I, I thank you uh, for participating in this hearing. Thank you very much. Our next and final panel is the Honorable Clark Ken Irwin, Irvin, a Director, Homeland Security Initiative, Aspen Institute, Dr. James J. Uh, Carafano, Senior Fellow, the Heritage Foundation, Ms. Susan Ginsburg, former Senior Counsel, National Commission on Terrorist Attacks upon the United States, what is, in fact, the 9-11 Commission, uh, and Mr. John Dan Morris, Retired Counsel General, U.S. Mission to Beijing, China.
you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Van Hollen. Thank you very much for inviting me to testify today on this critically important topic of whether four years after 9-11, security gaps remain in our visa policy that can be exploited by terrorists. There is no question but that it is harder than ever before for terrorists to get a visa to enter the United States. Before 9-11, it was relatively easy. Back then, even though the law required State Department officers to interview visa applicants, this legal requirement, as you know, was routinely waived. Though waivers were to be exceptional and interviewing applicants was to be the norm, in practice, the reverse was true. Indeed, as we heard, when an interview was granted, it was usually for the purpose of giving an applicant who'd already been rejected on a first documentary review a second chance to convince the State Department that he should be admitted to our country. And we all know now about the notorious Visa Express program in Saudi Arabia and like programs elsewhere that allow third parties in foreign countries to review visa applications on the State Department's behalf. Further, state consular officers had limited access to information in other government agencies' databases indicating whether a given applicant might be a terrorist. There was nothing in the State Department's class database indicating that any of the 9-11 hijackers was a terrorist, but there was information in other agencies' databases. Had that information been shared in a timely fashion with State, those terrorists might never have gained entry into our country. Fortunately, nowadays, there are no Visa Express programs. Most applicants are interviewed. Consular officers are better trained to spot terrorists and signs of fraud. The class database contains 21 million records of known or suspected terrorists and other people who, for some reason, are ineligible for visas, nearly triple the number prior to the attacks. And about 70 percent of the database is based on information passed to the State Department by the FBI, the CIA, and other law enforcement and intelligence agencies. So information sharing among relevant agencies is much better than it was four years ago. But I want to focus my remarks on, on the issue that you focused most on, Mr. Chairman, and that is the whole visa security officer program. Gaps remain in the visa process that terrorists could easily exploit to deadly effect. First of all, and most importantly, and I'll leave the rest of my remarks for the printed record, the Visa Security Officer Program provided for in the Homeland Security Act has not lived up to its promise. Since 15 of the 19 hijackers were from Saudi Arabia, this provision, as you know, mandated the stationing of Homeland Security Officers in Saudi Arabia to oversee state's administration of the visa issuance process to ensure that no more visas are issued to terrorists, at least from that country. The DHS officers sent were presumably to be expert in counterterrorism, fraud detection, interview techniques, and other relevant areas. The provision, as you noted, went on to say that visa security officers should be dispatched to every visa issuing post in the world unless the Secretary of Homeland Security can explain why stationing such officers in a given country would not contribute to Homeland Security. When I looked into the VSO, VSO program last year as the then Inspector General of Homeland Security, we found that it was not making much of a difference in Saudi Arabia. There were no designated VSO slots. The positions were filled by volunteers. And the volunteers were serving only on a temporary basis, resulting in a rapid turnover of personnel. I think the average was about seven months at the time. And the temporary volunteers were lacking in the basic skills they needed to be effective. For example, one officer had no law enforcement experience. Another had never worked outside the I, United States. I don't States. usually interrupt uh, yes. someone testifying, but when you say volunteers, I, that has a whole meaning to me. Uh, uh, someone from DHS who volunteering? That's right. Yeah, okay. That's right. Uh, another had never worked outside the United States, and as a result, he had no idea how an embassy works. Another had no knowledge of the visa process, and only one of the ten could speak Arabic. Even though the DHS and State Department officers were located just a few feet from each other, neither could then access the other's databases, so both were inputting and then sending back to Washington for a fuller background check, essentially the same information. As a consequence, precious time was being wasted by the State Department, the Department of Homeland Security, their respective headquarters, and other key members of the U.S. law enforcement intelligence communities, leaving the VSOs little time to do what they were supposedly uniquely competent to do reviewing visa applications strictly from a counterterrorism perspective. And there have been some advances in the VSO program in Saudi Arabia since then. As for the temporary, what I called volunteer turnover problem, according to the GAO, as you heard, DHS, DHS has hired and trained four permanent employees and deployed them to Saudi Arabia in June, and they are to stay there for a one-year period. As for language ability, two of the four reportedly speak Arabic. 
I understand from other sources that the VSOs are no longer wasting time inputting the same data and transmitting it to Washington that consular officers at post have already input. But as you heard, while there's anecdotal evidence that VSOs have helped to keep terrorists out of the United States, there's no hard and fast evidence of that because DHS has not kept track of any data that might shed light on it. More troubling to me, and indeed most troubling to me, is that the program, as you indicated, Mr. Chairman, has yet to be expanded to any country other than Saudi Arabia. If VSOs are such an effective counterterrorism tool, if they have expertise and access to information that state consular officers don't have, it is critical that they be deployed to every visa issuing post throughout the world as quickly as possible. Otherwise, terrorists could slip into the country by obtaining a visa in any of the other nearly 200 countries with which the United States maintains diplomatic relations. While DHS, as you heard, intends to add five posts this fiscal year, this fiscal year is nearly over, and as you heard, VSOs have yet to be deployed to any of them. While DHS intends to expand the program at the rate of five posts a year, this is troubling because at that rate it will take about 40 years for VSOs to be deployed worldwide, giving terrorists plenty of time to apply for a visa from countries lacking the putative protections of the program. And I'll close with this final paragraph. In my judgment, we should make VSOs as effective as possible. They should, in fact, be expert in counterterrorism, fraud detection, interview techniques, and the like. They should have country and area expertise, and they should all be proficient in the local language. And then they should be deployed throughout the world. We should not allow the State Department to exercise an effective veto over the expansion of the program by subjecting this program to the NSSD 38 Chief of Mission Authority process, by which our ambassadors, as you heard, are empowered to approve or deny other agencies' requests to have representation in the embassy. This process may ex be acceptable for the Agriculture Department. It is not acceptable for the Department of Homeland Security. After all, as you noted, Mr. Chairman, a compromise was reached between state and DHS to allow state to continue to process visa applications and to issue visas only on the understanding that DHS would have the final say on visa issuance. The fear was that absent the strong hand of a department focused exclusively on counterterrorism, the more diplomacy-oriented State Department might revert to a mindset that focuses more on diplomacy and customer service than counterterrorism. I'll stop there and, and be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Carfano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to applaud this committee on holding these hearings. You know, I would argue that in the area of interdicting uh, terrorist travel, this needs to absolutely be our number one national priority. And there's a lot of discussion about dealing with illegal entry into the United States and making the border safer. And, and I, would, I, agree, I would agree that that's important. Quite frankly, we know that virtually every known terrorist that's come in the United States has either uh, has used some form of travel document. And this is simply the number one. The terrorists seek to exploit every, every way to get into this country, but this is simply the number one way. And this simply needs to be our number one priority in this area. The, the one comment I would make is that as we look at these programs and, and assess since 9-11, I really think we need to be sober in our expectations. Uh, if we really want to make progress in this, in this area, you know, we have to have realistic deadlines. We have to have adequate resources. We have to have adequate human capital programs. We have to have clear standards. We have to have credible measures of performance. And we have to have integrated ID programs. And if you want to know why things aren't working better, you can look across all those areas and, and get the answer. Um, I, I agree with Clark. Things are absolutely much better than they were before 9-11. I don't think that's disputable. Uh, w one of the most important recent developments in, in my mind is the review of uh, the second stage review by the um, Secretary Chertoff in the Department of Homeland Security and two critical decisions that he's made. One is to create an undersecretary for policy and to elevate the International Affairs Office into that office and give it overall responsibility. I think that one of the things that's really hamstrung DHS since the start is that it hasn't had a coordinated and integrated approach to its international affairs and it hasn't had a high level uh, person directing overall policy integration in the department, and so that's critical. I also think establishing a chief information officer and, and breaking him away from the IAIP and, and focusing him just on intelligence and just on the issue of intelligence soaring is absolutely critical. And if there's one recommendation I would make to the Congress, it's to be fully supportive of the, secret, uh, the uh, secretary's uh, organizational changes that he, pr that he uh, proposed in the second stage review. Um, I, I think here's what we can say that we've learned over the last four years, and that making progress has been incredibly difficult, very costly, and very problematic. And 
So what, what I would really like to direct this committee's attention to is I really think we ought to go up back and ask a fundamental question is knowing that the ex making progress in the existing system is so difficult and so costly, we should really ask ourselves, do we want to continue on this course or do we simply want a new and different paradigm and to do things very, very differently? Uh, I, I think terrorism is a long-term problem. The terrorists aren't going anywhere. It took five years to plan 9-11. took three years to plan the Madrid bombing. This is going to be an endemic problem in the 21st century. I think we should take our time and build the system and get it right. And staying with a legacy system which we know fixing it and making it better is very, very difficult. May not be the right, we may not have made the right policy choice in the Homeland Security Act of 2002. I would argue that we take a different course. I think that it's, it makes no sense to divide major responsibilities between three major departments. I would consolidate them all in one, and I would argue that that would, uh, should be the Department of Homeland Security. And then. The three major responses being? Justice, Department of Homeland Security, Department of State. Um, and I would argue that uh, we go back and we start with a blank sheet of paper and envision a new program or a new system on how we want people to come in and exit this country in the 21st century. And I'll just end by, by commenting on, on two things that I, that I think should be an important part of that strategy. One is the visa waiver program. And I would simply argue as a matter of strategy that this is the right solution. If you can get countries into the visa waiver program and if they can and, and, and have a degree of due diligence that they are operating with the same due diligence that we are, you do two things. One is you build more geostrategic partnerships and there are lots of countries that we want to be opening and, and, and be stronger partners with. And the second one is, is then you take an enormous amount of resources and then you can then shift them to other states that aren't meeting that same level of due diligence. And the second point I would make is we really need the equivalent of the military war colleges and national defense university. We really need a homeland security university that brings together these mid-level people in the State Department and justice and homeland security to really have them th in an academic environment deep, really think deeply about these challenges. And one of them should be terrorist travel. There should be an entire academic environment for for these mid-level people to sit together and deep think about this issue. And so I really think that we do need some kind of equivalent to the war college experience for our, for our future leaders in these three departments and one of the core pieces of that curriculum, not something in the counselor school, not something as an add-on course, not Tuesday instruction, but a, but a serious intellectual development as war fighters think about how to conduct a campaign. People in these other agencies should be thinking about how to fight terrorism. Thank you. Is there any model of any school somewhere else, I mean, any country that has a school on Homeland Security? Uh, no. So you're being kind of like Newt Ging Gingrich thinking out of the box here, huh? Yeah. Okay. Ms. Ginsburg. Mr. Chairman. That, that's the mic that has the least uh, amplification. Do you want to just pull it closer to you? Mr. Chairman. Is it on? Do you have the light on? Just tap the top. D don't move it yet. No, tap this. No, that's not on. No. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Van Hollen. And I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I'm so sorry, but just lower the mic a little bit. And let's just see if we get an improvement. Thank you. Yeah. It is a privilege to appear before this subcommittee, which has maintained a consistent focus on the visa process since 9-11 and acted as a force for its continual improvement. Let me first summarize the GAO's key findings as follows. The visa process must serve simultaneously as an anti-terrorism tool and as a facilitator of legitimate travel. Consulates are still understaffed in numbers, expertise, and experience levels. Counterterrorism and counterfraud tools are improved but not optimal, and DHS's practical contribution to the visa process remains unclear. Each of these points calls for comment from a counterterrorism perspective. The visa process as an anti-terrorism tool. Visa offices are crucial screening points for the defensive blocking of dangerous individuals. Offensively, they help detect and counter terrorist operations and help counter the criminal infrastructure for illegal immigration, which also contributes to terrorist mobility. All terrorist groups have to execute certain basic functions, making decisions, communicating, recruiting, training, raising and distributing money, and moving people and material. Each facet presents a potential vulnerability. Terrorist mobility, the need to move people, is central. 
When terrorists need to cross sovereign borders for any of their critical functions, their vulnerabilities and our opportunities for detecting them are greater. The mobility function offers opportunities for designing new offensive and defensive measures. We can create new types of information based on it, use it as points of attack, or make it more difficult to carry out, especially secretly. Yet terrorist mobility has received significantly less attention than it demands. The visa process is central to this new field of terrorist mobility. The visa office is a key location where we have the opportunity to detect and intercept terrorists or at least ensure that they leave a footprint. This footprint can, continue, can contribute to a larger analytic effort by consular offices and others. This information will become relevant later when a new clue allows visa database information to be read as the record of terrorist passage. With other information, it can reveal patterns and trends and speed the design of new countermeasures. Visa offices, consulates, and embassies are also critical locations for crime control. Visa officers gain access to information that can lead to detecting false personas and fraudulent travel and supporting documents. When analyzed, this information will allow investigators, intelligence officials, and diplomats to take actions against the sources of those illegal, illegal travel tactics. This includes penetration of criminal networks, preemption, and deterrence. Visa offices must take an increasingly significant role in crime control against such illegal travel practices and organizations. This role adds a new dimension of importance to the personnel and practices dedicated to this function. Lack of trained personnel is unacceptable at a time when consular affairs has a critical national security role in countering terrorist mobility. I do not believe that role can be transferred to the DHS. The GAO reports significant growth in visa office staffing, but also presents a troubling picture of supervisory pos positions filled by entry-level officers, shortages, and language training deficiencies. Consular offices are transit points which force terrorists to surface and confront governmental authorities. They mu there must be people in place with experience in the region so that they are better, better able to read the clues presented by the people in front of them and to devise systems to improve information gathering. The Intelligence Reform Act recommended additional consular officers. Until this occurs, there should of course be a process of establishing priorities for filling posts critical to national security. Part of the good news in the GAO report is that the State Department is currently developing distance learning courses in the areas of fraud prevention and terrorist mobility. This is a good beginning as long as there are mandatory requirements. Once the courses are distributed, consular officers must determine whether they are adequate and what modifications are needed. Two other points about counterterrorism are important. First, each post's officers must have a thorough understanding of the role of that geographic area in terrorist mobility and in the criminal infrastructure for illegal migration. This probably means developing specialists at post for this purpose. These specialists would have a career path that reflected their role, such as cross-service in the intelligence community and at ports of entry. At present, there appear to be at least 25 visa fraud investigators deployed but no specialists in terrorist mobility. Only specialized knowledge, however, allows visa fraud to be recognized as terrorist-related. And it does not appear that the ability to make these assessments is a mandatory requirement for any of the fraud investigators. Second, there still appears to be insufficient focus on travel and supporting documents as a means of detecting terrorists. As you know, the 9-11 Commission found that 15 of the 19 hijackers were potentially detectable as terrorists by documentary indicators. Information relating to potential terrorist travel documents is extensive, is extensive detailed, and ever-changing. Rather than making information available only by classified computer, a better approach would be to automate it. Information relating to potential terrorist travel documents Currently, there are no electronic screening of passport books themselves and of accompanying documents. In other words, they look at the passport, it doesn't go through any kind of machine that can read it using technology. This can be done to detect, uh, to, to determine authenticity, to detect adulteration, and terrorist and criminal indicators. 
yet this, cap this capability exists and can be further augmented. The goal should be electronic screening of foreign passports and identification documents using these kinds of algorithms. One dimension of a terrorist mobility specialist job should be expertise in documentary indicators, just as there are forensic passport specialists today who supply the nation with expertise on fraudulent passports generally. Improved fraud detection through interviews with visa applicants and scrutiny of their documentation is, is a critical dimension of countering terrorist mobility, of crime control and immigration management. Once fraud of any kind is detected, there must be an additional effort to detect any links to terrorism or to a criminal organization that may have links with terrorists. According to the GAO, what consular officers are requesting are better counterterrorism tools and training. The basic truth here is that DHS personnel from ICE or CBP do not have any greater expertise in terrorist mobility than consular affairs officers. The experiment of having DHS visa security officers perform this role, for which they are no better equipped than the uh, personnel at the State Department, should end. Instead, there should be a focus on what functions DHS officers must fulfill overseas themselves to counter terrorist mobility. Consideration should be given to building up at least two important roles to supplement the visa function overseas. First, a serious program to staff airport embarkation points with DHS officers. That's a gap, especially for visa wa waiver program countries. Second, the creation of a team of agents from ICE, diplomatic security, and FBI to assist foreign law enforcement organizations in major cases against criminal travel facilitation organizations. To conclude, the visa process is central to counterterrorism, to crime control, and to immigration management, including the facilitation of legitimate travel fundamental to our commitment to freedom and to our economic well-being. Until visa offices and other border control points are seen as central contributors to counterterrorism, at least as important as the FBI, the intelligence community, and the military, their opportunities to combat terrorism will not be maximized. Visa offices need to become hybrid hubs for counterterrorism, crime control, and immigration fraud expertise. To achieve this goal, more personnel, greater specialization, new technology tools, and cross-training and cross-service among relevant agencies are required. The work of this subcommittee, highlighted today by analysis of the GAO report you commissioned, continues to be a source of innovation and excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Morris. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity today to present my comments on post-9-11 U.S. visa procedures from the perspective of a consular officer in the field. As you know, I recently completed a three-year assignment as Consul General in Beijing. I'm now retiring from the U.S. government after a number of years in the Foreign Service, primarily in consular work. In the course of my career, I saw many changes in visa work as the world became more and more interconnected, demand for U.S. visas accelerated exponentially, and technological innovations were introduced to try to help keep pace with efficiency and security needs. As I returned to consular work in the summer of 2002, following a period working in other Foreign Service areas of responsibility, it was evident the Department of State was in the midst of the biggest change regarding visas I had experienced. First, Secretary Powell had set out clear policy guidance that security is the number one consideration in visa processing. While self-evident, that reality had become blurred in the course of two decades of declining resources in visa work in relation to the growing work demands and amidst policy admonitions to consular officers to find ways to do more with less due to budget constraints. Secretary Powell's definitive statement has since been a watchword to all of us in the field as we're trying to, to carry out those um, changes. Second, Consular Affairs Assistant Secretary Maura Hardy put forth a series of detailed guidelines and instructions for officers in the field to ensure that the Secretary's policy would be carried out. These were very helpful to posts in sorting through all of their priorities and managing their workloads. Third, <clears throat> bolstered by Secretary Powell's 
Diplomatic Readiness Initiative, <clears throat> which increased foreign service officer intake, the department endeavored to provide sufficient personnel to posts to enable them to actually carry out the responsibilities fully. As a consular officer, I, I saw that it was the first time in at least a decade that I experienced replacement visa interview officers beginning to arrive as the officers departed on reassignment without lengthy staffing gaps. But staffing was then and, and still is insufficient in many consular sections abroad, as you've heard already today. In China, we suffered precisely some of the things we've been talking about today, including uh, particularly a shortfall in the mid-level consular supervisors. And this is, as you know, an echo from the drastic cutbacks in the intake of foreign service officers in the 90s. This put a lot more responsibility than was desirable in the hands of very talented but in inexperienced officers in China. The officers conducting visa interviews around the world today are highly motivated, they're intelligent and language capable, very aware of their important role in the front line of America's defense. They're also very hard pressed to handle growing workloads while administering new security procedures which cumulatively slow down the visa process considerably. From the post perspective, I believe the State Department policymakers have tried very hard to improve visa security procedures since 2001 and have made many significant improvements. Among these, the inclusion of substantially more names of potentially dangerous individuals in our lookout systems and success in the biometric registration or fingerprinting of virtually all visa applicants. <clears throat> Some other measures were not as carefully thought through, however, and have had the unintended effect of sending out an unwelcoming message to the rest of the world without adding significantly necessarily to the security equation. I provided one example of this in my written statement whereby security advisory opinion procedures directed primarily against terrorism had the side result of stifling U.S.-China academic exchanges in the sciences. Where they can be identified, these sorts of measures need to be reviewed and modified. And new security initiatives should be carefully considered, focused in, on concrete objectives, and take into account the views of embassies and consular officers in the field where policies meet reality. Finally, and most importantly, as alluded to many times today, it is critical that serious stock be taken by all concerned in the visa process of present and future needs for consular resources, especially staff and facilities. I will be happy to respond to any questions you might have on these matters. Thank you very much. All your uh, statements will be uh, included in the record in their full form. Uh, Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for your uh, testimony uh, this afternoon on this very important issue. And I, you know, listening, it's, we all agree with the mission, which is that these people on the front line should be protecting our security, number one, but also making sure that legitimate travelers get here. But as I listen to you, there are at least three different proposals with respect to the question of the uh, visa security officers, as I hear it. And I, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, didn't, I wasn't here, I don't think, when, when Congress uh, created the visa security officers. So I'm just trying to listen to figure out what makes the best sense as organizational policy. And I listened to Mr. Irvin, who said, let's continue along this path and expand visa security officers to every, should be deployed throughout the world. So you have the consular officers, and next to them you have the visa security officer throughout the world. Uh, as I understand Mr. Carafano's testimony, your long-term solution would be essentially to take the consular affairs away from the State Department and place it in diplomatic security uh, uh, department. I mean, not diplomatic security, excuse me, the DHS. Uh, and Ms. Ginsburg, you're suggesting that this has been essentially a failed experiment, that the evidence to, to date suggests that these security officers don't have a lot more training than their consular officers, and maybe we should end that experiment, put the uh, Homeland Security folks, uh, deploy them in, in other areas um, in terms of uh, disrupting travel patterns, terrorist travel patterns, and essentially, as I understand it, allow the consular officers to take on that expertise. And I understand, Mr. Morris, I'll even state that your views seem to be closest to Ms. Ginsburg. I wasn't sure. So 
you sort of have these different options out there. And just, you know, looking at the situation as we see it today, noting that we only have visa security officers in one country right now, uh, the delay in the expansion, and the idea that we do want to make sure that at the end of the day, although there are obviously higher risk posts, at the end of the day we want to make sure that there's no weakness in the system. We do want this emphasis on security uh, or, or security to be a paramount concern everywhere. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that it does make sense to have one, maybe one department in charge, except for Mr. Irvin's point is the different institutional sort of mandates where you have Homeland Security maybe focused more on security issues as opposed to the diplomacy issues uh, would be a, a counter to that. Yeah, I, I ju that's all by, by way of suggesting that, as I understood the testimony of the General Accounting Office, um, uh, Mr. Ford, he said that one of the main changes that he has seen with respect to the consular officers overseas, as echoed by Mr. Morris, is that people understand now that security should be the paramount concern and that should be the one one focus. Given that, why doesn't it make sense? And given the fact that we already have the consular affairs within the Department of State, why doesn't it make sense to make sure that the consular officers who are on the front line get the training they need? They're already deployed to every consulate around the world. Why don't we make the you know make sure they get the training they need to uh, develop whatever expertise that we want these visa security officers to have? Sounds like they don't necessarily have it right now. And that may, we already have sort of a, a deployment mechanism. Let's give them the expertise and the tools to do their job and let's get the staffing problem, which we all, everyone on the last panel said that was the primary issue. And yet, you know, we sort of move over it because, yeah, that means resources and all that. But why, why not look at the model that we've got and beef up the training so that every consular officer overseas has the training necessary? May I answer that first? Yeah. Well, certainly, Mr. Van Hall, I think that all the State Department consular officers should have that kind of counterterrorism counter training. And as you say, and as we heard, apparently more and more of them do all the time, and certainly that's a step in the, direct, in the right direction. I think all of them should, just as quickly as possible. But I'm just afraid that at the end of the day, there is an institutional mindset necessarily, and I don't think that, that that's not a normative statement on my part. I just think the facts are that the State Department tends to focus on diplomacy and customer service. The whole theory behind the Department of Homeland Security is that there should be a department that is, that is exclusively focused on counterterrorism. And of course, implicit in what I was saying is the notion that these DHS officers actually be qualified to, to do work in the counterterrorism area to the extent there are DHS officers, VSOs who aren't qualified. And as I said, when I looked into the program last year as Inspector General, many of them were not. But this presumes that they will be. But I'm just afraid that if we're not careful, as the months and years go by without another attack, and, and unless there's some huge increase in, in funding for the State Department, uh, the institutional pressure to revert to form, to revert to focus on, on diplomacy, will mean that we will be back years from now where we were before 9-11. Um, and as I say, you know, if it were up to me, if this were tabula rasa, I frankly was supportive of the notion of giving the entire visa function wholesale to a Department of Homeland Security, a competent Department of Homeland Security. But as a practical matter, that's not happened. I can't envisage that it will happen. That being so, this present structure is the one that we're going to have to live with. And if that's the case, it seems to me VSOs need to be effective and they need to be deployed throughout the world. Uh, putting aside the issue of which department it should be in, um, I, I, I would make the argument that, that it all needs to be in one department based on a, a very simple premise. Whether, whether it's visa issuance or border entry or exit, exit the, the basic functions to be performed are exactly the same you have, uh, that you need. Preliminary screening, secondary screening, and investigation. The, the, my notion is anytime you split those apart, you've created a seam that doesn't need to be there and you create potential problems. This is like the police department in which the beat cop and the, um, and the homicide investigator are in totally separate agencies. I mean, we don't do that. It's integrated. And so you want to have the guy that's doing the primary screening or woman and the secondary screening and doing the investigations that back that up all in one, all work for one person. You can put this finger in his chest and say this, and we can debate and I would argue, make the arguments why one versus the other. But I, I think if we want to move forward, rather than trying to m 
create seams that don't need to be there. We need to focus all this so the person can make the intelligent decisions about IT integration, human capital programs, resources, infrastructure. Anytime you have two people making decisions on those things, you've guaranteed that it's going to take five times as long and cost ten times as much. Well, my comment would be that we have in the State Department now diplomatic security uh, agents who are gun carrying investigators who refer cases to the to the uh, U.S. attorneys and that they are fully capable of carrying out the same kinds of activities that um, are being outlined for the visa security officers. The analysis, the review of trends, the regional expertise, the training of, of people like airline officials, all of those functions outlined um, by the witness from DHS are in fact what needs to be done. But in the two years, uh, these people haven't been deployed. They haven't been deployed uh, because there isn't that, res that, that bench of expertise that the new uh, security circumstances demand. There, there is a function in the State Department that can be expanded to meet this need. Um, and there's an there's a intelligence function in the State Department that's very well regarded. Um, and there's a deep knowledge already of immigration um, and, and criminal fraud matters relating to passports and visas, which is precisely the expertise that you need overseas. Um, I would argue that um, though that, that needs to be expanded, the function of the diplomatic security, um, the function of units like the, um, I think it's called the Vulner Vulnerability Assessment Unit in Consular Affairs, which is a new analytic unit uh, to, to take the data in the, in the in the consular databases and uh, create algorithms that help pre you know, predict where there are problems. Um, and that we need to do much more to support those functions, including um, for, oversee for investigations conducted by foreign governments of human smuggling organizations, major document forgers who are supplying and uh, the people who are then some showing up at um, consulates and looking for for visas. Uh, and, and those teams can be integrated teams with people from ICE and CBP, FBI, but um, there's no need to shift this function when you have within the State Department a, a fully capable diplomatic security uh, service, which, which should indeed be involved uh, more deeply with the consulates in looking at the visas. They can have ac full access to the NCIC data that, which we haven't discussed much today, which is one of the trouble spots. Um, they, they are fully qualified to review that data, and um, there's no reason why they shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and indeed, one of the problems was that the visa security officer haven't been able to define a role that's any different from what the diplomatic security officers can perform. Just to sum up, I understand each of your testimony was, if you had your wish, this function would be in one department. I mean, you might differ on which department it should be in, but to, just organizationally, it makes sense to put this under one department and, and get rid of this two people sitting side by side with really very much the same mission uh, at the end of the day. Um, I thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some other questions, but after. Uh, no, no, no. Keep going. Let, oh, let me just ask with respect to the that's uh, the waiver, the waiver program, uh, because. You know, there's no doubt, ideally, that if you can be assured that the processes and protections that are in place in each of these 27 countries are, are perfect, that obviously that's the best way to assure our security in the sense that, you know, if you, if you could be 100 percent guaranteed. But uh, that, of course, depends on us, you know, relying on the systems that are put in place by these 27 countries, and if the list expands, you know, more than that number of countries. Uh, and at least within, in, in terms of your ability to travel within 20, at least some of these 27 countries, within the European community, you know, you get issue your travel documents in, in one country, you can travel freely within the European community and get on an airplane uh, anywhere you want. I guess the, the question is, as we focus so much today on our consular officers, are we focused enough on, and do we have have we put the time into really reviewing 
uh, the security measures that are in place in, in the waiver countries. And I, I, I ask this question not because I think that, you know, we need to, to clamp down. I really, I, it, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the question. I know you have all probably looked at the, that question, uh, but it seems to me it would be a mistake to focus all our resources and attention on closing a barn door in one place while it was wide open uh, somewhere else. So if you could all respond to that, I'd appreciate it. First, if I could start on that, Mr. Van Hahn. Um, I looked at the security implications of the visa waiver program also when I was the Inspector General of Homeland Security, and, and I'm concerned about the visa waiver program. Uh, it, one of the things that we recommended in that report was the U.S. visit system be applied to visa waiver countries. And, and frankly, the Department of Homeland Security was slow to do that. We recommended that, I think, in April of 04. It actually wasn't done until the end of the year. And the Department has acknowledged that there are likely terrorists who would not have been caught had U.S. visit not been applied to travelers from those visa waiver countries. It's not for nothing, for example, that Zacharias Musawi, the alleged 20th hijacker, came on a French passport, that Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, came on a British passport, uh, et cetera. So it, it's very important. Secondly, as you suggest, uh, we learned when I was the Inspector General of Homeland Security that there wasn't sufficient oversight on the part of the Department of Homeland Security of the bona fides of the countries participating in the program. There wasn't the kind of regular review that is required to make sure that countries merit their continued participation in the visa waiver program. And even though, final comment I'd make, even though now, fortunately, the U.S. visit system is applied to visa waiver countries, there's still no way to match the biometrics of, of the travelers from the visa waiver countries with those of the applicant at the, uh, at the consulate because, of course, the visa waiver travelers did not apply at consulates. They did not have to obtain a, a visa. So it's a, there, there's a potential security gap there, needless to say, and certainly I would not expand the program. Yeah, well, of course, Clark and I just disagree on this. Uh, you know, first, the, my first comment would be that w one of the key criteria that no one's mentioned is reciprocity. Every country that we give visa waiver status gives visa waiver status to us, and they're also depending on us to keep terrorists from getting passports. And, you know, we can ask, you know, has the United, can the United States guarantee that we're never going to give a passport to a terrorist? And the answer is probably no. I, I, I agree with Clark that the visa waiver program was created before terrorism was a major issue and that we should look at mechanisms to strengthen the program, to add in criteria for terrorism, to uh, add in means of oversight. But I think the last thing we want to do is um, uh, to abolish it, and, and I, I would argue we need to extend it, and, and, and for, you know, two strategic reasons. One is, we, we have to get over the notion that the visa system needs to be perfect. Because we all know that, you know, getting that last 10 percent or 15 or whatever is 80 percent of the cost. Visas are part of a layered security system. And in the end of the day, the visas are never going to stop terrorist travel. What's going to stop terrorists is counterterrorism uh, counter operations, intelligence, and running, go out and get these guys. This is a part of a defensive system and a layered system. And so it doesn't have to be a perfect system. It just has to be a good, solid component. And if the expectation is no terrorist gets a visa, uh, other than that, you're not going to be a visa waiver, then there's going to be no visa waiver countries. So I think it's a bad expectation to, to know sh that, that this needs to be an ironclad, perfect system. Uh, if we just don't give t uh, pass uh, passports and visas to known terrorists, I'd be happy. Um, the second is, is we don't have all the resources in the universe. And we have to realize that every time we add a visa waiver country, that's an enormous amount of resources because most of these countries are people that, that uh, where most of the people come from that we can put on other places. I mean, there were proposals to end the visa waiver program, but when you look, when people started running the numbers and what it would cost and to boast the economy and in resourcing to try to give a visa to everybody that comes in this country now that doesn't need one, it was astronomical. So there's an enormous resource implication. It's a tough choice. It's a strategic decision. But it's an enormous amount of resource that you could fill up. And the third is, I think, you know, we've all talked about, and we can't give lip service to it, it's economic growth, it's civil society, and it's security. And all three are important. And we can't give economic lip service to the fact that we have growing strategic partners that sit and, you know, we've got Poland, which has people dying in Iraq and the Czech Republic, which has been great, and India, which is an enormously important strategic partner. And we've had South Korea, which has been a strategic partner for 50 years, and we've turned to these countries and we said, okay, countries like France, you know, they can come and go all the time even though they disagree with us, but you that, that have helped us out, you, you can't, you're not eligible for the visa waiver program. And that's simply geostrategically dumb. Um, these countries can meet these standards 
if we tighten our standards, they can meet these standards, and we should be, I, I, here I, I really disagree with Clark, we should make a strategic choice to identify key countries, to sit down and make a roadmap on what we can do to get there. If we need to add additional measures and oversight, we should do that, but we should be charging ahead trying to add countries on the list and make the countries on the list do better, not take countries off. Well, I mean, I agree we should strengthen the program, and the first thing we should do is look at the airport, look at the airport embarkation points with our strategic partners about what we can do to improve the security there, including through the use of um, overseas DHS officers um, that, that, are, that, are not, that are only in a very, very few places. Thank you very much. appreciate your presence at this hearing. The, um, you all have, have gone uh, well expanded what we discussed this morning, but if we just go back to what we discussed this morning, what was your re reaction to the testimony you heard this morning? Well, I'll start, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm very happy that you and Mr. Van Hollen probed both the DHS and the state personnel to ultimately highlight the fact that uh, the Department of Homeland Security has not, apparently, pressured the State Department and enlisted the support of Congress to dispatch these VSO personnel beyond Saudi Arabia as the law intended. Uh, and I think it's absolutely critical that that be done. Again, this presumes that the VSOs know what they're doing, but I think it is possible to find people in our country who can serve in this capacity. I question, again, for the reasons that I've already said, not to, not to beat a dead horse, whether State Department officers can do that. I think we need to learn from the lessons of history. After all, there were RSOs, regional security officers, before 9-11. Uh, there have been studies that have shown that, that RSOs have not focused on visa fraud to the extent that they should. I know something about that, having been the State Department's Inspector General and having fought jurisdictional battles, frankly, with the RSOs since there's a joint jurisdictional uh, overlap between RSOs and the Inspector General's office. So uh, I, I think it's critical that this be done, and then you highlighted the fact that it hasn't yet been done. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think what we heard was incredibly predictable. I mean, what, Congress split the baby in a not very clear way, and it forced these departments to figure out how they were going to seamlessly integrate their operations in areas where they have tremendous human capital, resource, and IT challenge. And really, they, they've asked them to do something that, that no federal agencies have ever done, which is to come up with a cooperative interagency federal program of a major scale with major resources on the line and say, and make it all seamless and do it in four years. And the fact that they're struggling with it, I just think is, is eminently obvious. And, and if it was anything less, I, I, I'd question whether I was on the right country. So bottom line, from your standpoint, you did it from day one. The, the system is so flawed that we developed. I mean, I think we're get, you know, I quite frankly think we're getting what we paid for. I mean, we're getting very incremental gains. The answer uh, is yes to my question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> there there seems to, to have been this morning a focus on resources, uh, right. the need for consular personnel. And this is a need across our entire border system, the ports of entry as well. The investment in the infrastructure, in people, in the information systems, um, is lacking and it's just taking a long time to be built up. I think we have to recognize that this is now a national security environment and there's a great deal at stake. Uh, so that when you are shorting consular officers, you're shorting uh, counterterrorism capability. And uh, although I, I don't fully agree with the, uh, the idea of full separation between departments. I think you need fusion centers like the uh, Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center, which is jointly run by the de uh, Justice Department, DHS, and the State Department, um, which is a center of expertise on human smuggling, human trafficking, and soon, I believe, terrorist travel. And it's that kind of interagency cooperation um, which I think is going to make a big difference in connecting dots and in understanding trends and patterns. I think uh, post abroad, certainly in, in so Beijing. The question, the question was, just want to make sure, the question yes. I first asked before you maybe mm -hmm. elaborate on what you just heard, um, what was your reaction to the testimony this morning? Uh, reaction to the testimony this morning on... on um, when you're sitting in the audience listening to this, what were you thinking? Well, I thought that uh, 
you know, as an American citizen, that uh, I was puzzled why uh, something that had been mandated uh, and two years later had not come about. Uh, and, and, and being a, a consular officer in, in Beijing didn't help me understand uh, the bureaucratic reasons why it had not happened, so I agreed with your question. Well, did, do you think the problem lies more with DHS or more with uh, the State Department? I honestly have no perspective um, particular to give on that. I, I, from, from our perspective and from everything I've heard in the State Department, we were told that this, was a, this is a great agreement, we're going to make this work, this is policy. A great compromise in the sense. Great compromise, yeah. and, and then we waited out in Beijing and nothing happened. Interesting. And when we discussed this with other DHS people, not in those types of programs, we didn't get very clear. Hold on one second. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, when, when, when we had chances to interact with DHS people in the field, uh, we would ask them what's going on because we wanted to, to plan for our own sections and how to incorporate them and how best to use them, and, and they couldn't really give us any uh, clear answers. So, so we were just in a waiting mode. Okay. I'm going to ask our professional staff just to ask a few questions, and I thank Mr. Van Hollen for thank being Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Morris, could you expand a little bit on what you were just talking about and on, on how at Beijing you coordinated uh, policy, programs, information with the intelligence, security, and law enforcement personnel uh, given this open setting? How, what was that conversation that took place? How did you get information from the law enforcement and intelligence folks? How did you incorporate that into your jobs? Uh, were they helpful? Did you have a good relationship with those folks? You mean the people at post, the representatives at post? Yes, sir. I thought we got great cooperation from, from uh, all the uh, other elements, uh, law enforcement elements, you know, the FBI, the DEA, um, you know, on and on. Uh, we, th th one of the things that, w that wasn't mentioned today was um, a program where each month uh, <clears throat> and more frequently, if necessary, uh, the country teams get together and they discuss sharing of, of information. This is a mandatory meeting and it's mandatory that we re reported back to departments called the Visas of Viper program. And any, the purpose of that is that any information that anybody has at post that's in any way t terrorist related to a potential future application should be shared with the consular section and you know they may be transmitting that back to their own uh, home agencies, but they're supposed to also give it to us, and um, uh, and then we uh, you know, transmit it back in our channels. Uh, we got a lot of information in, in Beijing. I think we got good cooperation from that. We we interacted with uh, the agencies on this uh, security advisory opinions on uh, related to not just terrorism, but also tech transfer, which is a big issue with China. They're trying to, to get our technology, basically, and we're trying to prevent it. And uh, when, when it's going to be used for potential dual use uh, and that sort, those sorts of things. And we worked very closely with the Defense Attaché's office, the commercial section, and others that had expertise in certain technical areas that we in the consular sections did not and sought their advice when cases came in. We weren't sure exactly what these people were going to the United States to try to, to, to ferret out and if it was legitimate or not. So we had very good cooperation on that and we worked closely with DHS also uh, locally, but they were not in this particular security role. And one of the issues that the GAO brought up was the need to increase access to the NCIC databases, the FBI criminal databases for consular officers who now it's my understanding essentially you get a name hit and it says, you know, call the FBI and they'll run, right. take a couple weeks, run a background check. How would, how would that have changed your job in China, the f folks under your, under, in your office in China, would that have made life easier? Was that something that just would have added time? Sure. The more information you have on an applicant, um, you know, the, the better. To, 
first of all, we had, we had enough information, we were given enough information to determine visa eligibility. So that's, you know, and that's our basic function. But if you're going beyond that, you know, to determine, for example, if there's fraud, uh, a fraud scheme going on or a terrorist scheme or something of that nature, uh, you know, the more information that you can get, you know, it gives you a clue to, to ask another question and to go further. So sure, the more information, uh, the better. And sometimes the information might be, oh, they had a drunk driving conviction in, you know, in Maryland, but okay, and then, you, then that, that doesn't help, but um, at least, um, but, but sometimes then it may, you may get some information that may, causes you to, to raise another question okay. and, and leads to a whole different line of inquiry. Uh, and then I guess my last question, and for all of you, but I guess we'll start with you, Mr. Morris, again, is are there, are there s security steps that have been put in place since 9-11 that maybe have gone too far um, that are not productive? In your testimony, you talked about the SAOs, but that seems to be something that's fixed. Um, there's, of course, there's the mandatory interview process now which is fairly controversial. Are there issues like that, or you can even expand on that one if you like? Well, I, I think that there are, there are a lot that are, that are coming up uh, in the future, you know, the, uh, more, more fingerprinting and, and more facial recognition, and, um, you know, there, there are many things that are coming down the pike. And I think my point is that uh, the department uh, you know, obviously, these are very, very important security issues, but posts need to be, you know, given a heads up. This is coming down the pike and uh, given an opportunity to, to come back and say, if you, did, if you do this, you know, you, you may make a policy decision to, do, to take this security step, but it's going to have this negative impact on tourism or business or, or trade or that sort of thing. So. And, and, there, and then there, there may be ways that uh, people, you know, in Washington that are developing these, these policies, can, they can tweak the proposals so that they don't have these unintended effects. And it, it, you say the security advisory opinion uh, problem has been resolved. Well, it's been resolved uh, in fact, but in terms of the perception in China and in the academic community and the academic world, it'll, it'll be years before the impact of that um, goes away. Thank you. Ms. Kinsberg? Um, I would just say that if you're going to add security layers and measures, um, w many of which are very critical, then you have to add the personnel and the technology to make sure they work efficiently. And that requires additional investments. Yeah, I, I'm opposed to mandatory interviews. I mean, I, th I think it's not even the same problem I have with what we're doing in airline security. I mean, we're using these legacy uh, uh, legacy paradigms to do this, and we're wasting 99 percent of our resources and 99 percent of the people that aren't a problem. You know, it's the, y this is the equivalent of the cops stuff everybody driving down the street and not just people breaking the law. You know, we simply need new paradigms that focus resources on the high-risk people and quit wasting resources on people that we, that we have a comfort level or that are a low risk. Okay. Thank you. Well, I uh, am a contrarian on this point. I disagree with Mr. Carafano. I'm a hardliner on security, and I think it's possible to be a hardliner on security and at the same time understand the importance of diplomacy and understand the importance of respecting our civil rights, civil liberties tradition. That said, I agree with Ms. Ginsburg that all of this requires resources. And I think one of our problems, and I've said this on many occasions, is that we've underfunded Homeland Security. There's this false distinction between the security of the nation, where we bear no, ex where we uh, spare no expense, a $400 billion plus defense budget, and literally a fraction of that, about a tenth of that, for the Department of Homeland Security. Certainly more resources are required. So I, I'm completely for mandatory interviews. Uh, that was one of the recommendations I made as the Inspector General of the State Department. I'm very pleased to see that that's happened to date. And uh, I can, perhaps it's a failure of imagination on my part, but certainly in the visa area, I cannot think of a single security measure that we've since implemented that I would take back. If anything, as you've heard me say, I would increase them. The final thing I'd say is GAO did make in its report today, as you know, the suggestion that a lot of time is wasted reviewing applications in Sa Saudi is the only place where VSOs are mandated and it's the only place, of course, where 
the VSOs have to review every single application. I suppose it's possible in theory to presume that some Saudi person who's some Saudi who is five years old, say, or some Saudi who's 99 years old, probably wouldn't pose a security threat to the United States. But frankly, in this post-9-11 environment, I am skeptical about the ability of our government, and I think Katrina showed a couple of weeks ago, I'm skeptical of the ability of our government to draw distinctions and to work in the gray areas. That being so, uh, I argue for more security at the uh, recognizing that that is very costly. And as I say, I for one, and I say that incidentally as a conservative Republican, uh, am willing to put the resources behind it. Thank you, Mr. Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. It's a little off subject, but I'm, I, I wrestle with it, and, and it gets to the point of how far does your security go? We are. Uh, hearing continually from universities that the best and brightest students are being denied opportunity to study in the United States. And I think that's tragic. Um, we are told that they have given up, in many cases, applied and been accepted in European schools, in Chinese schools, in Russian schools, but not in the United States. And um, uh, is there uh, any indication that? Uh, Students have been the problem in the past, number one. Um, and do you, any of you have a strong feeling one way or the other on this issue? If I could just start. Well, of course, some of the people we were concerned about on 9-11 were flight students. You're not talking about no, flight no, students, talking, certainly. But I'm talking university students going right. in for PhD programs and so on. And right. I, I can't think of any instance. But I agree with you. Certainly there have been, uh, there's been evidence to suggest that students whom we need for the continued economic success and the vitality of our country are going elsewhere because of the length of time it now takes for visas to be processed. And that's why, as I said, I think it's possible for there to be security and uh, uh, and in advance in, in liberty and economic uh, progress for our country, but that requires infinitely more resources. I think the State Department budget should be increased rather dramatically, right along with that of the Department of Homeland Security. Yeah. Known and uh, suspected terrorists have tried to come to the United States on student visas, but the more important point is known and suspected terrorists have tried to come into the United States using virtually every means, asylum, illegal entry. So every, if there's a means to get here, the, the terrorists have tried to exploit it. The, uh, there has been a decline in uh, foreign students coming to the United States. Uh, the security certainly uh, has contributed to that over the last few years. There are other reasons as well. Other countries have targeted foreign students and, and tried to bring them there. Uh, and it's a much more competitive world. And the United States is less competitive in getting students here. And the security is part of it. And it is a serious issue. It seems to have bottomed out. There's data coming out next month which will tell us if we turn the corner or not. But but even before 9-11, we were already on a decline for that. But, you know, you know, we have to look at these issues strategically. If we had infinite money to spend on everything, that would be fine, but we don't. And what we're doing is we're spending a lot of money on a lot of things and not getting much of anything. How and does that relate to my question? It, it absolutely is, because we need to make some hard choices. I mean, we're going to beat these guys in the end no, no, anyway, I, I, but I, the, the point is, is, is economic growth and competitiveness are part of national security. Making this country strong by bringing these foreign students here and growing our economy is part of what makes us strong and pay for national security. So when we say, well, we can't sacrifice security for these things, th those things are security. I, 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 you're making this point because you obviously want me to understand something. I'm missing your point. The, the okay. point is, wait, is wait that, that you, don't that know, you, don't, you don't know where I have my problem. So let me explain to you where I have my problem. You're making an assumption I'm understanding you based on words you're using that I'm not understanding. Not your fault, my fault, but, but it's your fault if you're not listening to my problem here. I asked about whether or not it was a cost to us to uh, deny so many students the opportunity to come based on either denial or taking too long. I mean, in other words, they apply, uh, Yale starts its program uh, in September, and uh, they can't even get here until December, they're out of the program. So what I didn't understand about what you said is you said it was resources. I you connect resources to to that issue? Uh, well, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. The security procedures that have been put in place since 9-11 have made less students come here, right. and it does make us less competitive. It's not the only reason why students are going other places and why we're losing competitiveness, but it is part. one of them. Okay. Um, the, the, the argument that, well, we, we can't make it easier for students to come here, we can't do this because it's security, I, 
I don't buy that argument okay. because it's e getting them here and growing this country and making it economically strong is equally important to the security of the United States as it is trying to keep terrorists out. And so the problem is? The, the problem is uh, you want a visa system that's good enough that keeps known and suspected terrorists from getting visas. But beyond that, I, I think you invest elsewhere in, in get going out in preemptive measures. So I, I would say in trying to, in defense of, in, as a layer of security, in trying to keep people coming to the United States and trying to interdict terrorist travel, the number one priority should be the legal means of entry and exit, the making sure that those documents are secure and issued to the right people, and it should be keeping known and suspected terrorists from getting them. Once you've done that, you take your investments and you put them elsewhere. Um, we clearly had a big problem at the beginning. I want you to put your mic a little closer. I'm sorry, it's not your fault. It's just the mic is not working as well. We, we clearly had a big problem at the beginning with huge delays and are now facing the diplomatic consequences of that. Um, I think there is a problem. There are still long, long delays in the tech visa category. Um, but. I think the answer, I, I definitely agree that known and suspected terrorists have been associated with the student program here and in England and elsewhere in Europe, and, and, it, and it's a serious consideration. So we do need security into that pro in that process, and we need uh, follow-up security by ICE um, using terrorism-related databases to make sure that um, there's continued compliance with the terms of the student visas. Um, so, uh, but, but I mean, we need enough people to do that, and we need it to move fast, um, and we need, not, we need not to have delays, as are illustrated by the problem with the NCIC data process. We need computerization, automation, um, algorithms, and all the things that speed up those kinds of checks. Okay. Mr. Morris? Uh, first of all, just would like to note that actually the numbers, at least from China, are, are bouncing back. They're coming back after decline, um, we've uh, had, we had, we had extensive public relations campaigns, you know, the, we welcome, you know, legitimate Chinese students, assistant so, secretary. So do they, if that's, if they're in increasing again, is that because they're just willing to wait an extra year and just, the, t the, the time frame clearly takes longer? Uh, for most students, uh, the time frame is, is really not an issue and never okay. has been an issue and the, and the refusal rate has never been an issue. It's more perceptions. Perceptions are, are huge in a place like China where, you know, one message goes out and, and they all believe that. So um, there, there are some, some still... Uh, well, I just would tell you, I've spoken to a number of different yeah. university officials, not necessarily presidents, and tell me they're losing their students and they're losing them because they can't get them in here. That's what they're telling me. Yeah. I think I think uh, in the in the years after nine eleven after nine eleven two or three years that's exactly true, but but I think that um, if you talk if you look at the numbers uh, okay. recent recently you will see that they are beginning to come back the Chi the Chinese students are beginning to come back but but I absolutely agree that uh, we're we're not only losing if if we discourage the students from coming we're we're losing not only the benefits to the, uh, our universities and the academic exchanges and our own e economy in the short term, but in the long term, uh, I've, I've been posted in other Asian nations where you go and you know everybody in, in leadership positions in journalism and politics and uh, business have had American educations and they send business our way, They're, they understand America. And I think China is such an important place. You know, we need that sort of, um, Interaction. Uh, people going back, bright students going back. Yeah. Now, Dr. Carafano was basically making the point that it's a flawed system. We have three folks involved in, uh, in this process, three different departments, and um, one would be better, and I think your choice was DHS, correct? I, I'm sorry? Yes, sir. Yeah. That's correct. I, I, nodding ahead doesn't get on the transcript. Yes, sir, that's okay. correct. Okay. Um, there's always, uh, when you, you, you know, you dig a little deeper, there's always these trade-offs and you realize why it doesn't happen like it seems so obvious, just have DHS do it. Well, I'm trying to recall, but I, uh, it, you know, I rarely had conversations with the secretary directly, but this was one area that he was pretty concerned that this would be taken away from state. 
And I then remember having conversations with other state officials and said, you know, this is part of the work that you do in state, and it's kind of like you have to earn your spurs, and it uh, helps round you as a State Department official. Uh, it interacts you with the communities and so on. So I, aside from that, no one in government likes something taken from them. There appears to be logic to why you would want them to interface that way. Uh, at least to me, I'd like you to react to that. In other words, if you did take it away from state, not likely to happen, but if you did uh, and give it, uh, this whole process to DHS, uh, what is there a cost to state um, in your judgment? Would they suffer from it? Would we have um, our, would our State Department officials, when they were senior officials, have lost some experiences that would be important to them? Let me start with you, Mr. Morris. We'll go that way. Do you understand the question? <laughs> you mean taking away the visa function from the State Department? Yes. Would it, uh, the argument, I could just tell you, I could agree with Dr. Carafano that, you know, just give it to DHS. In other words, you want to come in the United States, you just give it to DHS. And I see you shaking your head, but that, I can see the argument. Uh, but then I can see a counter argument that says State Department, um, which is maybe more warm and fuzzy. Um, uh, may need that process of interacting with the community, uh, that, that country, people coming in, requesting to go to the United States. The interaction may be part of what's needed to round the State Department experience for someone so that when they're a senior official, they went through that process. Did you go through that process as a State Department official? I, I think uh, ab absolutely. I mean, uh, relationships between nations are not just you know, sitting in big meetings and talking about the six-party talks. They're human relationships. And, and, you know, I would argue that those are the most important relationships over time that nations develop. You know, we, we're close to many countries in the world because our, our people, um, they have an affinity for each other and they, and they have relatives and they... Um, I'm, not, I'm not arguing about yeah. whether people should come in the United States. I'm arguing whether, and I'm sorry this seems to be so complex, I'm arguing whether there is an argument that State Department needs to be the one handling it so they have that experience as part of being in the State Department, as a, making them a well-rounded State of Department official. Did you, ha did you do this process? Did, did you go as a, as a junior officer in State, did you do that? Uh, I, absolutely. I started, you know, as, as a vice consul. If and that had been taken away from you as an experience, would you be less of an official? Absolutely. Okay, that's the question. Ms. Ginsburg. I, I think that the, the idea of having one department um, only involved in Homeland Security is, um, you know, would be very atypical of how our government works. We have criminal justice uh, c capacity across many agencies of government. We have intelligence capacities across many agencies of government, um, including in state and local police forces, um, including um, increasingly functions relating to immigration. Um, I think there's a kind of seamlessness that's needed for, ter for terrorism that can't be confined to one department. Um, so competitive intelligence, um, sources of information that are multiple, um, different takes on a problem are very, very valuable when you're dealing with an, an adversary that's so elusive. Okay. So uh, I think it's, you know, there's an important function in so the So you're making department. the argument that you're not concerned with more than one department gets involved in the process. Right. Dr. Califano. Well, the answer to your question is no. I mean, there's other ways that State Department officials could get the cultural and professional development they need to proceed in their career. And you know, quite simply, visa processing is not central to the core mission of what the State Department should be doing in the 21st century. And it is central to the core mission of what the Department of Homeland Security, which is preventing, the tr which is supervising the means of trade and travel in the United States to prevent terrorism. So it's, it's, it's vital to the core competency of one department. It's an add-on to the core competency of the other department. It's only there because it's always been there since the, since the 18th century. That's a poor reason to keep it there. Okay. Well, 
I agree with my colleagues in part, and I disagree with them in part. I, I agree with Dr. Conif Carfano that there are other ways, it seems to me, for State Department officers to get the interaction with the local community that they need in order to be effective in that country and in order to be effective later in their careers. Of course, there are political officers <laughs> and embassies. There are economic and commercial officers. There are other things that consular officers do besides the visa function. So there are other ways to get that experience. Point one. Point two, I am actually not opposed to the present <coughs> bifurcation. I think as compromises in our government go, uh, the logic of it, and that is the key word, makes a lot of sense. It is the effectiveness of it that I question. Uh, I am just afraid that if, in fact, DHS were to have the entire function, although if you have to choose one agency or the, or the other, I would put it in DHS, okay. but the problem, it seems to me, with giving the entire function, not just looking at things from a counterterrorism perspective, but the whole visa function to DHS is the opposite problem, that you need to focus on diplomacy as well. Uh, a DHS officer might focus on duly on counterterrorism at the expense of diplomacy. Can, can I just follow up on that? Sure. Yeah. I, 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 simply do, I simply think that's a false argument. I mean, one of the arguments not to give it to which, DHS. Which argument? The, the argument that security, the security culture is going to twist this in some way. The argument against giving it to DHS was, well, those guys only care about security. They're not going to care about diplomacy and trade facilitation. So that's one of the reasons why we have to keep that in state. But if you look at the evidence, for, for example, the recent GAO investigations or interviews of, of, um, of, of State Department officials in Canada, and, and if you talk to any State Department that's in the visa process, they all tell you that their number one concern is security. So, I mean, yeah, the, the guys that were supposed to be only concerned about trade facilitation and diplomacy, they're obsessed with but security. So but I, uh, I could use your argument and just use it against you and, and make the point that to say that State Department is one dimensional would be false, too. Well, I absolutely agree with you. And, and because DHS has people who are as concerned with trade facilitation and movement of people as they are with wait, security wait, as well. So, so if you agree with me, what is your point? The, there, is no, there is no notion that because you put it in one department, you are going to get this kind of insulation and, you know, and they are going to look after these other things. So, but you, your point to this. It is a false argument. Okay. <laughs> your it, point to this committee is, though, that you would prefer, in fact, you think it is nonsensical to do it any other way than to have one department. And um, the reason why we took it away from State, where we had uh, them do it, was we felt that they were uh, too much involved in the service side of it and not enough involved with uh, security side. That is the reason why we did it. Yeah. And I, I think that is the wrong argument. I, I don't think it is. The culture argument, I think, is, fl is not a valid basis for the decision. The reason why I would take it away from State is I don't think it, it is a core competency of the State Department, and I think it is a core competency of, uh, and a core mission of DHS. Well, someday. Right. <laughs> well, should yeah. be. Yeah, okay. Um, is there anything that uh, we need to put on the record, any question we should have asked, uh, any statement you want to put on the record uh, before we close up? Maybe just one final thing, sure. sir, not to belabor the point, but I think it is important in this last exchange to be clear about what the it is and what the core competencies are and what was taken away and what wasn't. I mean, to be precise, of course, the visa function itself, the entirety of the visa function was not taken away right. from the State Department. It is only that the question is, should there be some additional layer of review strictly from a counterterrorism perspective? to make sure that in the future, to the extent that can be humanly done, of course, we won't let terrorists into the country. The question is, should there be that additional air review, and if so, who should provide and, it? And the question that we can't answer today, which is kind of pathetic, is we have had two years' experience uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, tell us the benefit. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's inexcusable that it's taken us two years to determine whether the program is effective. And if the program can be as effective as Congress initially intended for it to be, then it's critical, as I said, that it be expanded throughout the world because terrorists can go to any of a 209 other visa issuing posts and get a visa there. And at the very least, to do it in a few other, it's in a sense, of, it's become a pilot program based on the, the pushback of state Precisely. and the lack of aggressiveness on the part of DHS. Precisely. Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're, you're finally getting through to me here. Okay. <laughs> Any other comment? Um, so with that, I thank you, all four of you, for your testimony. I appreciate it very much. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>
The U.S. Senate's gaveling in momentarily. They'll start with an hour of general speeches, morning business, and then resume consideration of 2006 spending for the Departments of Commerce and Justice and Science.